Thank you. And Doreen, if you would call the roll, please. Peter Freilinger? Here. Kyle Noonan? Here. Michelle Stevenson? Here. David Bork? Here. And Christine Snow? Here. So we have a, a full quorum, just to confirm that. And uh, with that, I will um, ask to review. Sorry? Mr. Newman's going to be a voting member. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mr. Newman is a voting member. He's normally an alternate, but he is a, a voting member for today. I accept. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, then I'll go on to the minutes from the February meeting. We did not have a March meeting for lack of quorum. So uh, does anyone have any comments for the minutes from the February meeting? May I ask then for a motion to approve? Thank you, Mr. Bork. So moved. And a second? Second. Thank you, Christine. Uh, all in favor, we'll just do uh, by hands. Uh, all in favor, um, unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Um, the first item is our two six-month extension requests. The first is for um, appeal 2737, an appeal that we approved last year for uh, um, uh, Thomas and Gwen Moore for 8 Shell Street. Um, do we have the folks here? We don't need them here. We, we don't. No, Normally I, we don't. Exactly. And, and, and certainly given the d challenges that people have had with finding contractors and what lately, this is not necessarily a, 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 unusual. Um, do I have a motion to approve this? So moved. Mr. Bork, thank you very much. The second? I'll second that. Thank you very much. And uh, all in favor, could we call the roll on this? Peter Freilinger? Aye. Kyle Noonan? Aye. David Bork? Aye. Michelle Stevenson? Aye. And Christine Snow? Aye. Perfect. Okay. Similarly, for the second item, item 5B, um, a, a extension request again for a shoreline setback determination at 64 Jones Creek Drive. We approved that last October for Harold and Kathy Caldwell. If they are here, yes. Do you have anything to add for that, or do you wish to speak? Do we have any concerns as a board? Otherwise, I'd ask for a motion to approve. Mr. Bork? So moved. A second? I'll second that. Race to the finish. Thank you very much. And uh, again, if we could call the roll for the approval. Kyle Noonan? Aye. Peter Freilinger? Aye. David Bork? Aye. Michelle Stevenson? Aye. And Christine Snow? Aye. And that is approved. Thanks. We understand and thank you for your patience. <laughs> the next item is number six on the agenda, approval of administrative appeal notice of decision, finding of facts and decision for appeal 2742. Uh, this is an administrative appeal by the office of David Laurie on behalf of state manufactured homes um, for uh, we dealt with this at length both at the January and February meetings. I believe we have the findings of fact as prepared for us by our external counsel and reviewed hopefully by everyone. Everyone's had a chance to review this. I'd like to open this up right now to any comments by the board. I'll start if, if um, no one minds. I, I thought that paragraph 14 could use um, just some clarification. Um, as drafted, it says, while the situation is somewhat unique because sewer for the dwelling unit is not being provided by the Scarborough Sewer Department, I would propose to strike the remainder of that sentence and replace it with, all parties agreed that South Portland is currently refusing to provide sewer service. I wasn't entirely clear on what the second clause of that sentence was was saying, and I think that. But the the point was that um, typically, while we handle um, we handle properties that are connected to the Scarborough Sanitary District, this one is not. And the point is. South Portland is not willing to, pro to connect sewer service right. to the property. So that was sort of the, to me, the key takeaway. Mr. Bork? Yeah, just to comment on that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I interpret that a little bit differently. Uh, I, I think what, what this attempts to point out is that um, it's not uncommon for municipalities to provide sewer systems to abutting municipalities, you know, throughout the uh, greater Portland area. 
in fact, you know, probably in a lot of places. Uh, and, and that's that's really what that point does is it really clarifies that the city of South Portland uh, is responsible for providing source service to that. Uh, further on here, it makes a point that the two parties could not agree, which is a separate issue. Shoot, I hear what you're saying. Mr. Bork, what do you think of adding? I, I do think we need to make some kind of finding somewhere that, that I mean, the key point is that South Portland is currently refusing to provide sewer service to the property. Ms. Snow? I, I get your point about clarifying. I do not feel that South Portland's unwilling. I feel the applicant is unwilling to um, come and provide their end of the bargain. So I'm not, I wouldn't use that language. And I don't see South Portland as unwilling. I would agree. And I, I think the language that you're getting to is, is adequately covered in, in 16. I do think, though, that there, there is a point being made here on item 14 that, um, to your point, Mr. Bork, uh, that, that such arrangements are not uncommon in the greater Portland area is probably not adequate because it's not really explaining the fact that a separate municipality is providing the service. And that's, I think, really what needs to be clarified in item 14, that, um, that South Portland would be the provider to the, to the unit. Um, and such arrangements where one municipality's sewer district provides service is to another, to a property in another municipality is not uncommon. I think that's the point being made on 14. Whereas to your point, I, I, um, Kyle, I think, I, I think that disagreement or the current impasse between the two is, is, is held in, in item 16. Does that make sense? Yeah, I do, I do worry. I, I just wanted to include some kind of explicit finding of fact that not to say whose fault it is, and that's beyond the scope of our, right. you know, yeah. but, but just the, the key point is that there is not currently an arrangement yeah. in place. And I think that that was just an important fact to be okay. part of, because I, I assume that this is going to be appealed. I, I agree. So I, agree. I just wanted to make button up our factual findings. What I might propose then is that for item 14, we, we amend that to say, while the situation is somewhat unique because sewer for the dwelling unit is not being provided by the Scarborough Sewer De Department, Attorney Daggett credibly testified that such arrangements where one municipality provides sewage service to a property in another municipality are not uncommon in the greater Portland area semicolon, and that as of the date of the appeal, South Portland had not agreed to provide municipal sewer services to the property. Yeah, I like that. I, I would make one tiny change to your, um, to your revision, which was where one municipality provides service, just to clarify, because I'm not entirely sure what the status of the Scarborough sure. Sanitary or sewer department, is it is it Scarborough Sanitary District? It's a qua, it's a quasi municipal agency. Okay, no, so okay. so we should so I think we should so say we're we? we're one municipal we're a municipal or we're a system in one municipality or a system based in one municipality provides service to properties in another municipality. Yeah, I, I understood. Doreen, does that make sense to you? Got it. And then I think we're good with the semicolon, and then after that, where again South Portland is not agreeing to provide, has not yet agreed as of the date of the appeal to provide service. Again, that's a finding of fact, so that should be fairly straightforward. Were there any other issues here that came up? Michelle, no, no, and and just for clarification or for for. Explicit here, um, I instructed the board not to discuss this amongst ourselves. So all of our reviews happen individually. We, we, we are, 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 are um, we're, we're quite militant about our observance of the Open uh, Meetings Act here in, the, in, 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 in town. So um, 
we're coming together here to discuss this. We have not discussed this prior to this. So with that correction to item 14, um, I believe we can say that we've these findings, in fact, accurately reflect the board's discussion um, in February and um, our, our, uh, and, and our review and uh, uh, concurrence with the wording of these findings of fact as of today. Could I ask for a vote to that effect, or for a motion to that effect? Uh, so moved. Thank you, David. Second? Second. Thank you, Christine. And uh, uh, roll call, please. Kyle Noonan? Aye. Peter Freilinger? Excuse me. Oh. Hold on. Uh, what we're voting for here is whether or not the, uh, the, the appellate Okay, which is uh, state manufactured homes, is valid. So we should be saying yes or no to their appeal. No, actually, what we're going to do here is we're going to view. Um, we're going to have two votes actually. Okay, good. I just yeah. want to clarify. Yeah, no, we're going to have two votes. The first is to say that this is our findings of fact. Okay, thank you. And then the okay. second vote will be the approval of the appeal, the denial or approval of the appeal. Thank you. Gotcha. So again, I'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll start that again and again. It's on the findings of fact, um, and uh, that was what I assumed your motion was for. Yep. And you assumed your second. second was for Christine. Thank you very much. We'll start with that again, Doreen. Tom Lunen? Uh, aye. Peter Freilinger? Aye. David Bohr? Aye. Michelle Stevenson? Aye. And Christine Snow? Aye. And on that basis, I think we're at this point ready to um, uh, have a, a vote on the appeal. Um, do we have a motion to deny the administration appeal, uh, straight of appeal as we agree, as, as the findings of fact indicated? Uh, should, not, should it not be worded as a motion to approve? I don't know, actually. That's a, I, I don't know. In the past, that's the way we've done it. Gotcha. Okay, so. You always make the motion in the affirmative. Right. The motions are always affirmative. You make the motion in the affirmative, and then you vote to. to and we then we vote to either so approve or deny. I will, I will defer to the far more learned gentleman to my left, then. I'm not sure I'm learned. But <laughs> <laughs> then may I ask for a, a, a motion to um, approve the, the administrative appeal? So moved. David, thank you. Uh, second? Second. Christine, thank you very much. And uh, is there any discussion before we take a final vote? No. And then may I, um, we'll take a vote by rule. Um, Doreen? Kyle Noonan? No. Peter Feilinger? No. David Bork? No. Michelle Stevenson? Nay. And Christine Snow? No. That is unanimous then. The board has voted to deny the administrative appeal. <laughs> Uh, uh, number 2742. Thank you very much. This is going well tonight. I like these fast ones. Um, okay. We, uh, first off, on appeals, we have four appeals tonight. Appeal 2743, special exception by Tracy Lane. Appeal 2744, which I believe has been pulled. Is that correct? It's been withdrawn. Thank you very much. Um, so we will not hear 2744 tonight. 2745, a practical difficulty variance appeal by uh, Mary Josephine and Patricia Keenan Mills. And then appeal number 2746, a special exception appeal by Matthew Ruinch on behalf of Portland Rugby Football Club. Um, at this point, I think I have to say something. Is that right? Anything else? No, that, that, uh, We're ready. Okay, gotcha. Uh, I'm, as soon as I can turn this thing right side up. <laughs> so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a brief thing here. In each instance, the burden on, is up on the applicant to demonstrate compliance with each of the criteria or provisions of, a, of the, the various appeal, uh, applicable appeal. The board will ask questions as necessary to understand the nature of the appeal as fully as possible. Okay. When all testimony has been heard, the chairman will close the record and the board will adopt findings of fact for each criterion of the appeal and vote to determine if the applicant has met the burden of proof necessary to meet that criterion. It's important to note that if any of the appeal or special exception criteria have not been met, the board must deny the appeal or application. In many cases, cases the appellant or the landowner may have a personal problem which prompted the, the request for the variance. Please understand that this is not legally relevant to the appeal no matter how sympathetic the board may be, be to the appellant situation. After the board votes on the merits of each criterion, a motion will be made to approve the appeal, and if there is a second, discussion will follow. The board will then state conclusions of law based on the findings of fact to support a decision on the motion. In most cases, the board will request that staff prepare a draft written decision based on the stated findings and conclusions, as well as the audio, video, and supporting materials in the record for approval at the next meeting. 
A general vote will then be taken on the appeal. If the majority of the voting members present vote in the affirmative, the appeal is approved. If the majority of voting members vote in the negative, the appeal is denied. The board's decision stands as of the date the vote was taken, regardless of the final written decision. Generally speaking, appeals from adverse decisions must be filed with the Superior Court, except as otherwise provided by law, within 45 days of this board's decision. Also, if anyone present at this hearing may wish to preserve your individual right to file any such appeal, you must be certain that this board's re record evidences your appearance this evening and the basis for your support or opposition. And again, I will remind everyone that this is a public hearing. It is being recorded, um, hopefully being broadcast with good audio video. And, uh, and as people, as individuals, particularly fo folks who are not um, appellants themselves, come to speak, remember um, if you could just sp state your full name for the record and your address um, or, or uh, your address here in Scarborough and your reason for appeal or for, for being heard. With that, um, I'll also note that um, you, if you've been here, you just heard us um, approve and vote on findings of fact. Generally speaking, appellants will have a full, full decision in tonight's meeting. We will vote and approve the findings of fact the following meeting, but the decision tonight is what will bind you and enable you to move forward or not move forward on your appeal. So just want to be clear with that for everyone. Everyone's um, done. So with that, we will begin with appeal number 2743, special exception for home occupation by Tracy Lane, 12 Arborview Arbor Lane. Um, so is the appellant here? If you would, and uh, begin with your presentation of your appeal. Hi. Hi. Is the is your mic working? Uh, can you hear me? You can yes. Okay. Make sure you're speaking into the mic, and if you could just say your name and. Uh, my name is Tracy Lane. I live at Twelve Arborview Lane in Scarborough. And I would like to have a reflexology practice in my home. I'm not sure what, <laughs> if you are asking me questions now or. Um, if you go could go here? through, it, it, what we'll do here is we'll go through, um, if you could just give a general overview of your appeal, and that's very concise. <laughs> um, but if there's anything else you'd like to say, otherwise, we'll start going through your actual application and, and, go, and go through your findings, and then we'll discuss that as a board. Sure. Um, it's, it's planning to be in, um, if you're looking at my house, the front room to the right of the house. Um, you would just walk in and be on the first floor. It would be a part-time business, probably two people a day for three, about three days a week, approximately. Um, I guess maybe just going over the questions will help explain a yeah, little more. We, we could go that, that, that yeah. would be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes people have some prepared remarks ahead of time just to start okay. things off with. That, okay. that will be fine, yes. Okay. So you filled out, and um, so maybe you could, you, you could start with your application. Um, the standards have a number of requirements set forth for them, so yes. if you could describe them. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reasons of sewage a disposal emissions to the air or water or other aspects of its operations? Yes, there will be no unsanitary or unhealthful conditions. Um, it's a reflexology practice. Reflexology is a specific touch technique that applies pressure to reflex areas of the hands and feet. Okay. So there's nothing. The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity? It will not create unsafe traffic conditions. It's, as I noted earlier, it will be a part-time practice. Uh, there will only be one additional vehicle in the driveway at a time. Uh, I will approximately have two clients a day, three days a week, as noted. I will not have clients coming back to back. There will be time in between. So only one, one extra car in the, in the driveway. I'll be summarizes the proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created from existing uses in the neighborhood or create uh, a greater degree of municipal fire protection requirements no extra public safety or fire is needed the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies none whatsoever and thank you for 
this is a formal process, so we appreciate you walking should, through this. I, yes, Thank you. absolutely. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, et cetera? Yeah, there's no added structure. Uh, as I said, the business will be in an existing room in my home. And we'll ask the town to hear, we'll, this is, if this is located in a shoreland zone, it will comply with all requirements, but Mr. I can Smith. confirm it's not in a shoreland zone. The applicant has sufficient right, interest, or title in the site to be able to use a carry of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Yes, I am one of the owners of the house. My husband, Chris, and I own the home. And that you have the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and comply with any conditions that may be imposed by the zone of appeals. Yes, I do. I'm a certified reflexologist. Great. And the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses of the neighborhood with respect to generation of noise and hours of operation. There will be no extra noise. It's very, a very quiet environment. At this point, does any member of the board have any questions of the applicant? I don't either. Um, and are there any members of the public that wish to comment, or have there been any members of the public that have given written or email feedback? I've received no written comments. Gotcha. Then with uh, if, unless there is objection, I will close the public hearing of this for for this item. Hearing no objection. Okay, board. Um, this seems fairly straightforward, but we'll go through each item. Item A, do we have any disagreement that there is that will not create unsanity or, or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage, et cetera? No disagreement at all. I think that uh, this is a not impact use. Gotcha. And I'll nod on this one. This doesn't seem very detailed, so I'm going to go on nods and say that A has been met um, in, in the eyes of the board. B, um, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. Are you going to take a photo of each one of these? We probably should. Wouldn't that be a good idea? Otherwise, you're going to go through it five times. So. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So, good point. So, could we take a vote on item A? Um, or, do you just want to show a hand, or you want to? The vote is whether each criteria each has been satisfied. Each criteria has been presented. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So A through A through I. Do we do have to each one individually? On the special exceptions, excuse me. On the special exceptions, we each criteria individually. We usually do the performance standards as a whole. Right. Got it. Okay. Um, because again, I, I'm just. Concern. Because it has to meet each of those criteria. Yeah, okay. Um, and do we need a motion and a second on each one? Uh, I think you can just do a show, you know, just show up here. Okay. At this point, um, before we start the vote, I would ask across the A through I, are there any real objections on any one of these? Because I'd like to be expeditious on behalf of, the, of everyone. Okay. So on item A, uh, I'd take a vote. Do we agree that there it will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reason of sewage disposal, et cetera? By show of hands, it's unanimous. We agree. The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in the vicinity. Do we agree by show of hands? Agreed. One, Mr. Chair, there's one problem with the way you're doing this. We, we're not doing any findings as we're going. You're just taking a vote. Yeah. To, to be clear, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, I'm used to corporate boards, maybe, in the, which, which so are we, a little zippier. On everything, so. we do have to do the findings of fact and then the conclusions of law. So a few, a few simple statements as to why exactly. the board feels oh. that okay. it's met that criteria would be very helpful. And then take the vote. Yes, make comments for each one. Got it. They don't have to be lengthy. Got it. I apologize. I'm used to, to again, I'm used to corporate or, or for-profit corporate boards where we often move very quickly. So apologies to the members of the public. We, don't make, any members. we don't make any money on the zoning board. No, we clearly do not. <laughs> we clearly do not. So um, I, I think um, on A, then, we agree that, that the reflexology practice um, does not create any conditions of sewage or emissions to the air and therefore would not create any unsanitary or unhealthful um, disposals or emissions. And by, by su such virtue, we agree. Um, for item B, um, before we take the vote, I'll be special about this one. Um, I think what we've heard is that um, with 
uh, uh, one vehicle at a time, two clients a day, three times a week. That's very much in keeping with an R4 district um, that, that barely meets social niceties at a property. Um, so uh, I think on that basis, we can agree. I'll, or, I'll add one point, too, for findings sure. of facts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, the, the applicant has provided photo photographic evidence of the driveway. True. The size being comp uh, adequate to mm -hmm. be able to handle the minimal flow of traffic that mm -hmm. will be here. Good point. There's not going to be a street traffic yeah, or no street parking street, or anything like that. No street tra uh, parking whatsoever. Uh, easy ingress, egress. You could even, if you were parked, you could actually even back into that space and drive out if you had to. So yeah. I don't think. So uh, do we agree that item B has been met by show of hands? Great. Would anyone like to prevent me from screwing up and add some comments for item C for no public safety problems? Sure. Thanks. I'll take a stab Thanks, at Michelle. it. Um, this will not create any public safety problems or extra fire police protection that is needed um, any more than a regular household um, occupying humans uh, and animals. So uh, I don't see any issue with having needing extra fire and police protection. Anyone have anything to add on that one? Okay. By show of hands, do we agree that item C has been met? It's unanimous. And, and just to be clear, are we all, are we also with these votes adopting the findings of fact as yes. they're okay. yes yes. Um, so item D again, if we could have a comment from the uh, member of the board to discuss to summarize potentially our view on um, whether it will result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect there on. Yes, Ms. Stone. There will be no. <clears throat> Adverse effects on the environment, an occasional visitor coming into her driveway and staying for a short period and going away. Any other comment? Okay. Uh, one, Mr. Bork? one more. Uh, since all the activity is inside, uh, it has no external impact at all. Agreed. So on, the, on that basis, do we find those facts and agree that item D has been met? By show of hands. Agreed. Item E, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity of their business, and density of development. Ms. Snow. The structure is not being changed in any way, and the, um, the practice will take care and uh, be taken care of in an existing room in the home. Agreed. And again, I'll, I'll mention that two visitors three times a week comports to what a small family might have for children um, coming over for visits. So this is clearly not within the, the, the contemplated volume of use for the R4 neighborhood. So with that, if we find those facts, do I have an agreement? And can I see a show of hands? Hold on. I just, I just want to add one more thing here sure. as far as external. Um, w one of the things as we get into the next section is signage. So I'd just like to make reference to the fact that the applicant will be permitted to have a sign which will have some impact on the outside, but it's minimal and it's within our zoning regulations. Yeah, and it's within the R4 zoning in particular, yes. So, okay, so do we agree then on, the, on those facts that item E has been met by show of hands? That is unanimous. Um, item F, uh, Town staff has already indicated that the property is not in the Shoreland zone, um, zone, so I will accept that as a finding of fact. Um, could we have a quick show of hands that we agree with that? Thank you. This applicant has sufficient right, title, or interest in the, pro in, the proposed, in, the, in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. Any comment on that from David? Uh, the applicant has provided um, a copy of their tax certificate and um, to show proof of ownership. Any other comment on that? That's fairly straightforward. Uh, do we agree with that finding of fact, and do we agree that item G has been met? Show of hands. Agreed. The applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to section five, subsection 5 of this section. First off, 
I don't believe, but I will confirm with the board that we don't intend to apply any conditions as a part of this appeal. I, I agree. Gotcha. Thanks. So we um, have, a, have, a, have a nod on that one. Um, do we have agreement that, um, or do we have a comment on this? Yeah. All right. So first of all, I think the uh, applicant is a certified, uh, is now a certified refractologist. I didn't pronounce it right, so pardon me. Um, and they've already paid the fee for this application. I don't know if there are any additional fees required, uh, to, you know, to be a, uh, you know, to be licensed in the state of Maine. Uh, uh, just if I want to um, make my business an LLC, I'll have that type of thing. Okay, as an but, LLC. Okay, so yeah. these are all standard fees, and you're prepared to. Yes. Okay. Yes. So just just to say, you know, for the record, the applicant has paid all the necessary fees in order to be able to practice as a reflexologist. Thank you, Ms. Bork. That, okay. That's good clarification and good finding. Um, and I don't believe there are any other, given that the, um, the, the, the applicant is certified, I don't believe there's any other technical or financial aspects we need to review at this point. So um, if we could agree with those findings of fact and um, agree that therefore item H has been met by show of hands. Agreed. And the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operations. And I'd invite anyone to. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so the hours of operations will be between the hours of nine and six. And um, since it's only one um, client at a time, and there's only two clients per day, three times a week maximum, uh, then I think the impact will be completely negligible of the neighborhood. Any other comment? I'll briefly note that again, the R4 district is designed for primarily residential and rural uses, and those would include, again, homes where people would naturally come and go and visit and, and, and be part of the social fabric, and this doesn't seem to be anything out of the ordinary from that perspective. So on that, I would invite us to think, uh, uh, ask for any other comments on findings of fact or otherwise, we will find those facts and find that item I has been met by show of hands. Unanimously found. So, okay. I will then ask for um, Performance standards? Performance standards. Right. So, <laughs> so I, would, I would suggest to the chair that um, if anyone, has, uh, the applicant has provided um, comments or res responses to the performance standards in yes. their application package. If anybody found anything in there that they don't disagree, uh, that they disagree with, or they don't agree with, um, if, if not, I would suggest that the chair uh, ask for a motion to um, uh, accept that the performance standards have been met as a whole. Yeah, and and first of all, I want to thank the applicant for putting those on one handy sheet of paper so we can see those all in one place. That's not often done. So, um, but they have been presented to us, or, or did everyone have a chance to review those? Yes. Okay. Um, and then I would uh, ask for a motion to, to, to accept these as, as given um, by, by the board. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Bork. Second? I'll second that. Thank you, Michelle. And um, we'll call the roll on this one. Kyle Moonen. Is this a yes or an aye? Either. Either one, yeah. Yes. Peter Breilinger? Aye. David Bork? Yes. Michelle Stevenson? Yes. And Christine Snow? Aye. As a very brief aside, we've never had a consistent yes or aye standard on Thank you. Board, so Thank yes. you for the so, clarification. So that was for the performance standard. Yeah. That was for the performance standard. Yes. Okay, so now you can do an up and down. Vote. Okay, so now um, we're ready. We've The performance standards have been accepted. Um, the uh, board has uh, found that the, um, the items under the application have been met. Um, could I have a motion to approve the appeal? Ms. Bork. So moved. Second. I second. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and uh, call the roll, Doreen. Kyle Moonen? Yes. Peter Freilinger? Yes. David Bork? Yes. Michelle Stevenson? Yes. And Christine Snow? Aye. Well, uh, the motion, uh, the, the appeal passes. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. And good luck with your business. Thank you very much. That. 
We're not on Two Rod Road yet, are we? No, we're on Pearl Street. Okay, got it. Okay, thank you for letting me get my paper in order here. Um, the next item, again, 2744 was on the agenda but has been withdrawn. Um, the next is appeal number 2745, a practical difficulty variance appeal by Mary Josephine Keenan and Patricia Keenan Mills of 22 Pearl Street um, in Higgins Beach. Um, are the appellants here? Yes. Wonderful. Um, if you would uh, take the podium, and, and again, if you have some remarks to open things up, and then we'll start with the appeal process. Okay, I, 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 I do. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mary Jo Keenan. And my sister, Pat Mills, is, is with me this evening. And we both own the property at 22 Pearl Street at Higgins Beach. Uh, we want to thank all of you on the Zoning Board of Appeals, first of all, for your commitment of time and patience for the town of Scarborough and for all of us. Uh, we also want to thank Brian Longstaff and, his, Long, Longstaff and his staff for helping to guide us through this process, which has been a first for us. Um, so we are here because we would like to add a partial second floor to the existing building at 22 Pearl Street. And the exact dimension, it's, it's non-conforming, of course, and the exact dimensional reduction requested is 6.8 feet on the side and 2.7 feet on the front. And I think that covers the overview. Mr. Chair? Yes. I have a quick question for the uh, applicant. Please. Before we move on to the um, specific uh, items on the uh, process. Uh, do you also own the property, the other buildings on, on this lot? Yes. Yeah. We. Okay, so there, I count two other uh, living um, buildings plus a shed, is that correct? Right. We, we have two um, winterized buildings in the front, 22 and 22A. In the back building is a cottage that's just a summer cottage. Right. And there's a shed that's movable, though, in back of 22. Okay, thank you. I remember, yep. Yeah. And as I understand it, this is... The, the variance is required. You're not expanding the floor area of the building. Right. It's you're adding a story to the building. Right. Um, a partial story. A partial story. And, and, and so how, how will there be changes, significant changes to the roof line or the roof overhang or anything like that that, that, would, that would, in other words, in any way change the, 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 the overall footprint of the property? And I'm not sure overall is a weird... Um, if you look at the, the pictures that... Yeah, that's the building plans. The, the pitch is different. I know that because it was a lot of talk when we had to get the building plans done. Okay. Um, and this is, I believe, the final um, okay um, pitch. Does this change any drainage off the roof? Because you're very close to the, to, the, to the property. It's very close to the line. Yes, it is. <laughs> would this result in in, in um, runoff from the roof going on to the neighbor property or... Or how, how, how does this affect, um, how, 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 might, how might that affect the neighbor? I, I, the, the, on the right-hand side, there's a, um, mm -hmm. if I, I've sent some pictures, you can actually yeah. see, but I may have one here that's even a, a better picture. It was, and, and, and I apologize, it was tough to visualize from what is yeah. today to what was yeah, the um, proposed new structure was looking like. So. I don't, I can't tell you the exact um, feet we are from uh, the house right next door to us, which is 24. We have adequate drainage for any you know, runoff from the roof with, you know, proper gravel. And gravel and all that stuff. Yeah. But Does the current roof get to step out to the same degree that the proposed new roof will step out? Uh, that, that, that was my big question. Right. Looking at the pictures, the I couldn't tell. The itself is going to be different because it's, um, you know, with the dated 30-year-old roof that's there now mm -hmm. versus what's proposed with the addition, um, it should be different, but the footprint is going to be the exact same. So gotcha. it's not going to be more overhang. Okay. This kind of gives you, 
don't know. I don't know if you have that in the packet I gave you. Yeah. This one. It kind of gives you an idea, but it, it's just the picture of it. So um, it has a bit of an overhang. Okay. But that, all of that is going to be graded better and also have rocks there. We just t took a fence down that was on, um, on the other side of that. You can see the, the, the post right next to the, um, the propane tank in the back of 22. Mm -hmm. And we just removed a fence. That's why there's all that stuff there. But come very soon, we'll be cleaning it up, putting um, river rock and all that stuff there. Okay. So. Uh, Mr. Chair, just to further clarify that. Yeah. So the footprint of this building will not change. The overhangs and so forth are exactly as, will be exactly as they are now. Exactly. So there won't be any additional stormwater runoff. And it's the roof eaves that I'm thinking about. Those don't change at all. You're not pushing those out. Those are exactly. I don't think so. Okay. I don't yeah. think so. Okay. That was the clarification I was, I, yeah. I was looking for. Um, okay. Then um, are there any other general questions from the board for this, for the applicant? <clears throat> Okay. Otherwise, we'll go through the. And now I have to get my paper back in order. Excuse me. Let me see. This unfortunately. Okay. So if we could go through the application on itself for, mm -hmm. for practice, practice difficulty. Yes. Again, we'll ask you to just read in your responses as, yes. as completely as you can. So okay. generally describe the project and why a variance is needed. Okay. The exact dimensional. Gotcha. So we're on number one. Number one. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yep. Thank you, David. Do, do, do. The need for a variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. Um, we are applying for the practical difficulty variance because the building 22 that we would like to add on to does not meet the minimum setbacks on the front and side. As you probably know, this property was developed long before zoning and the establishment of setbacks. This property is also unique to most properties at Higgins Beach because it has three houses on it. This makes it more difficult to bring any or all of the structures into compliance. The granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. The, the proposed addition to number 22 will make the building more conforming with the Higgins Beach character code by creating a front porch and a second story in an exhibit 2A, you can see some of the neighboring properties which have porches and second floors. The practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. Uh, the buildings on the lot existed more than 100 years ago. Therefore, the footprint of the buildings is non-conforming. The buildings were built before zoning standards were adopted, so there was no action since that time that created the practical difficulty. No other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance? Yes. Um, our budget for this addition is approximately 275000 It would not be financially or technically feasible to move the building to meet the side and front minimum setbacks. Technically speaking, moving the building 22, seven, uh, about seven feet sideways, almost seven feet sideways, to conform to the eight foot side setback would bring the building too close to building 22A. And as you can see in exhibit 4A, the move would place the building in the middle of the walkway. Also in exhibit, exhibit 4B, our builder addresses the difficulty of working on 22 if it was to be placed that close to 22A. As a clarification of this as well, yes, I know that all three of the the dwelling units on the property are not in conformance. Right. So in essence, moving one building into conformance would likely then require another building to be modified to then become in conformance, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So you sort of have a bit of a daisy chain issue, in other words. It certainly does, actually, yes. Not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. The, the cottage is actually conforming. The co cottage is really? On yeah. The, on the, because, on the yeah, because it would be an accessory building. Oh, right, ADU. That's, a, that's new. Yeah. 
Um, but the other one, the 22A. 22A would not yeah, be. that's right. That's okay. Right. Okay. Sorry, um, just wanted to. That's okay. Yeah. Um, number five, the granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Uh, the granting of a variance would allow us to add a second story in front porch to make number 22 look more like other properties on Pearl Street. I don't, um, we're not actually doing the front porch. I'm a little confused about that, but we're not doing anything. Yeah. I can add to that. To okay. Clarify. Sure, yeah. So, so what they're actually doing, is the, the front porch that you see in this view, mm -hmm. in this view, this being the front porch, is actually the front of their existing structure. Exactly. It's, it's the same so footprint, right? That's, exactly. Yeah. And so they're coming back to go up, and, and in doing so, they create a conforming porch, which is a requirement. So it's, it's very clever the way they're yeah. taking the existing footprint and actually making the structure more conforming with yeah. the Higgins Beach form based code, which yeah. I thought was, was quite clever. That's helpful clarification, too, because the picture doesn't make it look totally like a porch. It kind of looks like, right. yeah, okay. Um, number six, a ver granting of variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural, natural, natural environment. Uh, the footprint, of course, would be the same. That one. The property is not located in whole or in part within a shoreland area as defined by code um, and the Scar Town of Scarborough floodplain ordinance. Is that right. correct, Mr. Longstaff? Yes, I can verify it's neither in the floodplain or in the shoreland zone. Great. And please demonstrate how the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which a variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the zone in which it is located and would also result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Okay. Uh, we would like to add more sleeping space to building 22, and the only way we can do that is by adding a partial second floor. There's no other way to add additional bedroom space in, in living space. It's going to have a small living area upstairs, too that would conform to the Higgins Beach Character Code, and while adding the second floor would conform, the building's existing location is non-conforming. Um, as we mentioned, our budget is about, it is approximately $275,000 for this project. It would be an economic hardship to make number 22 conform to the side setback by moving it over, say, seven feet, almost seven feet. Um, in Exhibit 8A is an estimate from our builder if we had to make the building location compliant. Um. Ms. Uh, <clears throat> and do you have a cost on that? I saw that in the handout. Okay. Uh, just, just for the record, what, is, what would be the cost of moving the building? It, it would be about 79300 he said. So I want to yeah. get in there for the and, record. And that's not coming across any ledge or anything, which there probably is. Exactly. It's purely... Because it was on the back of the front one, 22, way down the corner. So. And that would be exclusively to, to move the building, not to make it conform with the character code or any of the other. Right, things. exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, exactly. Sure. Is this a, some, a dwelling that you have, that someone lives in year-round? Yes. And by adding the second, the more, more sleeping spaces, would you have to, if we were to deny this, and you didn't want to move the building, would you have to, what would you, what's the economic injury there? Would you have to sell the property and move, or well, you is know, it imperative that you have sleeping spaces? Do you have un enough people occupying this house right now without enough sleeping arrangements? Right. We do. Is that here? Well, it, it, this is a <laughs> tough part of these. But I always have these. a hard time with exactly. this one because right. you have to show that you're going to have economic injury if this doesn't happen. So okay. that can mean a bunch of different things. Correct. Okay. So the, the property and the houses have been in our family for over 100 years. Can you step up to yeah, the... Yeah. 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 Excuse me. Yes, once again, I'm Patricia Mills. Um, so the property and the houses have been in our family for over a hundred years, and um, were rented, you know, way back when. And when our grandfather handed them off to our father, who bought them from the from the um, um, family members, and then forwarded them on to myself and my sister to keep them in the family, um, they were always rental 
rental houses. We renovated them, winterized two of the three, uh, approximately 33 years ago. And we do hope to, I have two children that would really wish to, I wish to have them involved with the, you know, living there and certainly with, as time goes on with their family members. So we do certainly wish to have more than it's a very compact space um, as we speak, speak right now. But I don't know if that answers your question, but. Thank you. Yeah, that was Thank you. Okay. More information on that. Thank you. I'd just like to add to that that it's a permitted use um, and uh, other properties um, uh, adjacent to it are already with two stories. Uh, so I don't really see where there's a, um, a problem with you having this because it's something that is common yeah. in the Higgins Beach area and, and actually what you're asking for brings you more in conformance. The injury clearly is the $79,000 that it would take to move it. That's the only other alternative. Okay. That's, the, that's the damage uh, if you had to move the building in order to come into compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's over and above, you know, the cost of construction, you know, which you budgeted already, you know, cer you know a certain amount of money. But, you know, so, you know, you know, to me, that's the key thing, is the, mm -hmm. is the dollar amount of, that you would suffer, yeah. you know, if you had to move the uh, property over, mm -hmm. which, again, may not even be possible, you know, given the information that you've provided on yeah. the um, estimate by a, a reputable contractor saying that he wouldn't touch it. Well, and actually, we, they we could not, they couldn't use the back doors because you couldn't yeah, yeah. Right. get in. So it's it's unique in that respect. Anything? Any other questions for the panel on this one here? Otherwise, I think we've covered the application. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Was there any public comment or are there any members of the public here to comment on the the uh, appeal? We did have some. We have the written one here. I saw the one. So those, I do, yes. Doreen, those have been entered into the record, correct? Okay. So we've got two um, that are, um, one with very large font, uh, uh, um, <laughs> That are both supporting the the, the appeal. I could read this. One. Exactly. Yeah. I actually I actually had to push it back. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, but both were supportive, and I think again, it's particularly in Higgins Beach, that's something that that can not often be the case, or not always be the case, I should say. Um, so uh, we we accept those with with uh, with appreciation of the public. Um, with that, if there's no other public comment, I'll close the comment portion of this, and we'll enter our deliberations. So closed. Um, so, uh, a quick general conversation, and then we'll go into the item by item review. Any other questions we want to have before we start the process? Um, just, I just want to make one comment. Uh, uh, obviously, it's a, a very well uh, presented um, appeal. And uh, oh, thanks, it, it's, it's very nice that uh, you work closely with Brian to put this together mm -hmm. um, in order to get guidance. Uh, to be able to you know, present oh, yeah. an appeal that uh, was easy yeah. for us to understand and mm -hmm. review. So yeah. I just wanted to add that in. Oh. I'd add that especially okay. you're um, not coming to us with <laughs> uh, a contractor or with representation to the board. You're doing this as um, property owners. Mm -hmm. We really appreciate you um, doing that. We, the, that, wow. that makes our job easier um, and, uh, and certainly makes Brian's job and the, and the, and the, the code enforcement officer's yeah. job easier as we go forward through the process. So thank you. Yeah. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. So with that in mind, we'll start this off with the findings and with our um, uh, acceptance or, or disagreement. You can have a, yeah, have yeah, a seat. Yeah, have a seat yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so uh, this one, again, these are, are more, comp uh, this one is a more traditional, very, uh, um, a, a, a variance. We'll go through this one by one. And, and what I'll do, as we've done in past times, I'll ask one of you to kind of frame the comments for the board, and then we'll talk about it from there. So the need for variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Kyle, start us off. Sure. Um, so I think that this criteria is uh, met. It's because the 
um, the, the, the lot has, um, it has three houses on it. Um, and um, in order to do um, the, the structure to be added onto um, just doesn't meet the setback requirement. And um, so I think that the need for the variance um, is due to the unique circumstances of the property. Gotcha. Any other comments, any thoughts? David? Uh, yes, I would uh, simply add to that that it's very unusual to find three residences on a tiny lot like this, plus a shed, um, and that uh, that certainly makes this unique in that area and really anywhere in Scarborough. Christine? It seems that the applicant has made a thoughtful and modest proposal for changes. Agreed. The other thing I'd say on this one is Higgins Beach, a lot of people always say every property in Higgins Beach is unique. Um, but um, in many cases, they're, you're, you're, you're splitting hairs to get it that way. This is not one of them. You're right. There are three buildings in the property. That's unusual. It's a property that still has three single-story properties outside of the character code which most properties in Kiggins Beach have been since redeveloped to be in conformance with the character code. Um, so I think they've definitely demonstrated that they've met this item. Um, so uh, again, I'll, I'll try and compress the cycle a little bit. I'll ask if we can um, agree that we, the findings of fact demonstrate, for the findings of fact as we've described them, demonstrate that this item has been met. A show of hands. Terrific. The granting of a variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or fair market value of abutting properties. David? Well, actually, this will bring it more into conformance with the Hickens Beach Codes and uh, make it uh, more in conformance uh, to, the, uh, to most of the properties around there, uh, which will enhance the uh, values of all the other properties. Uh, because it makes the, more of that particular neighborhood a conformance. Great. Any other thoughts? We're all in general nodding in agreement with that one. I agree. Um, so uh, based on those findings, um, can I uh, um, have a show of hands that we agree that item two has been met? So demonstrated. The practical difficulty is not the result of action taken by the applicant or a prior owner. I'll take this one because it's quick. Um, as many of the cut properties in Higgins Beach, it's well over 100 years so, um, since the footprint was done, and uh, therefore um, the applicant did not create the conditions by which the variance is required. Any, uh, does anyone have a, other thoughts? Terrific. But if we agree with that finding of fact, by show of hands, we agree that this is met. Thank you. No feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance. Michelle. Yeah, it looks like they um, provided uh, what it would cost to move the whole building itself um, and explore other options to make this feasible. And this is the best option um, all around. Any other thoughts? I'll just, oh, David, go ahead. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I would say it's the only option around. Um, you know, there really it's not practical to move the building, and given the fact that um, but the lot coverage is so dense, you know, because of the three residences, and of course the shed could always move, but you know that's how much. Um, it, it's there really aren't any other options at all. This is the only feasible way of doing it, and they are not increasing the coverage of the lot at all of this particular building, I should say, um, number, lot of building number 22, uh, which means it doesn't have any you know, detrimental impact on the, uh, on the lot yeah. or the neighborhood. I'd agree, and I'd, I'd also note that any modification of any building on this site, with the possible exception of the cottage um, as an ADU, would require a variance. So it's, it, no matter what they did to any of these buildings, they would be for us looking for some kind of a variance. So on that basis and with those findings of fact, um, do we agree that item four has been met? And by show of hands, yes. The granting of a variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. Christine? Uh, most of the properties in the neighborhood have a second story and this will make the 
building more in compliance with the other buildings. Great. Any other thoughts on that one? David? Uh, most, most of these, like, you have a, we're talking about 100-year-old uh, buildings here. Uh, in, in that neighborhood, they all, back then, it was all seasonal cottages. Uh, over the years, um, these seasonal cottages have become year-round homes. And um, this change will bring it more to conformance with the way that neighborhood has evolved. Great. On those findings and with no further discussion, um, by show of hands, we agree that this item has been met. Great. The granting of a variance will not have an unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. Kyle? Sure. Um, so well, this, I think granting this variance will have no effect on the natural environment because the footprints of the buildings won't change. It'll just be the addition of a second floor to one of the three structures. Gotcha. Great. Any other thoughts on that one, David? I just said one more point. And there's already adequate um, uh, provisions for a stormwater runoff. Agreed. Yes, we've had, and we've had re representations that there will be um, uh, 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 a stone drainage put on the side of the building, um, which, will be, which will be good um, and is not currently in place. So um, with those findings of fact, and uh, do we agree that item six has been met by, by show of hands? Great. Uh, the property is not located in whole and part within a shoreland area. Again, we've had representations to this effect by, the, by, um, by staff um, without objection. We'll agree on this by show of hands. And then finally, the, the tough one for these um, variances, as always, please demonstrate how the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property that is permitted in the zone in which it is located and would also result in significant economic injury to the applicant. Um, jump ball. Christine. They have a growing family, and they have a property here that they've had in the family for a number of years, and this makes it more usable for their family. And the alternative would be they wouldn't be able to keep the property. Any other thoughts on that one? David. Yeah, I think here we need to also include that uh, the, the only other feasible option would be to move the building. And... Uh, I believe the applicant has shown that that's just not feasible, and it would create economic injury to have to spend the $79,000 to move the building had it been feasibly uh, optional, uh, 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 available to do. Agreed. I'll make two other observations. One is, even if they moved the building, they would still be before us for a variance, which would ask this same question, and the same question would probably result in, in a similar answer. Um, and at the same time, would then compress the property into a position where we might have different um, answers to is the proposed variance in conformance with other properties in the area. We would be putting a building within a foot and a half of another building and squeezing the properties, uh, the, the, the buildings together. Um, so it, it does feel like while this one can be some, at, at times a difficult um, uh, 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 item to meet. In this case, they have adequately demonstrated it, and again, importantly, brought the property and the the building more in conformance with the character code of Higgins Beach, with the agreement of their neighbors and uh, and the rest. So, um, if we agree that those are adequate findings of fact and uh, that this item has been met, I'll accept a show of hands on that basis. Terrific. Um, then I think we've gone through those, and now we simply need a uh, motion to approve the appeal. So moved. Mr. Bork, a second? I'll second that. Michelle, thank you very much. Um, are there any, is there any further discussion before we move to a formal vote? Um, then, uh, Doreen, if we could call the roll. Tom Lunen? Yes. Peter Brunlinger? Yes. David Bork? Yes. Michelle Stevenson? Yes. And Christine Snow? Aye. The appeal passes. Thank you very much, and uh, good luck with the, uh, the renovations, the construction. Okay, now again, the board chair has to get his paperwork in order, which takes another 74 minutes to do. Okay.
And we will now move on to the last appeal of the evening. Uh, appeal number 2746, a special exception appeal by Matthew Winch on behalf of Portland Rugby Football Club, 122-142 Two Rod Road. Um, is Mr. Winch or is a representative of Mr. Winch here? Both. Terrific. Mr. Winch, Gotcha. If you could uh, take the podium, please, again, and announce yourself for the record and uh, give us a quick overview to start things off. Absolutely. Hi. How you doing? Um, my name is Andy Nelson. I kind of serve two roles. I'm part of. The, I'm a member of the of the applicant of the Portland Rugby Football Club, and then part of the development committee uh, that's bringing this forward. I also am the owner of the Sewell Company, which is the, one of the firms that is working on the project on the technical services, the engineering firm, as well. So, uh, just wanted to uh, just briefly introduce um, uh, Matthew. We'll go through uh, the standards. So, I just want to say thank you very much for having you know taking the time to to hear us today. I uh, just wanted to give a little backdrop and just sort of introduce, you know, uh, the concept and, and, and what we're doing here. Um, uh, the Portland Rugby Football Club's uh, been around since 1969. Um, we have a robust uh, men's program that started in, in 69. We have, um, and the women's program started in 1977. We have more than 300 members that are local Greater Portland business owners, professionals here. Uh, so we have a very, you know, robust, active organization. Um, and Portland has been our home for that whole time um, on Fox Street. Actually, the field that's down on Fox Street has, has been our field. We've we've really experienced over the years the the seeing the demand for athletic field space. You know, particularly you know, we we see it with anyone who has kids. You see it with your kids. You know, trying to find athletic space. We see it too with adult amateur athletics as well. Um, the challenge there, right? Um, and so, in fact, we've rented fields in Scarborough, your high school field, num numerous times. You know, for rugby matches and so forth. So it's this has been a long-standing goal of ours. We formed uh, as a 501c3 um, 20 years ago, uh, with an eye towards doing a project like this, uh, so that we really had a you know a really you know, first class athletic field uh, for our use um, and started this project two and a half years ago, actively looking, you know, looking for, you know, for property. Portland was hoping to keep us in Portland and was, and was super supportive, obviously less, less land around Portland. And so, you know, we wanted to stay in the greater community. We have numerous members of the, of, of our organization that are Scarborough residents as well. And so we uh, acquired um, the properties at 122, 140, uh, to 122 to 142 Two Rod Road last year, um, and and have done you know a fair amount of due diligence on it, whether it's you know survey work, wetlands work, you know to understand you know what what we could what we could do there. And I just wanted to uh, I'll just uh, Matthew again will walk through uh, uh, the specifics. I just wanted to make it clear like what we're showing here is is ultimately a multi-phase vision. You know what we're really focused on is is the first phase, which is just the bottom field on the lower part of the here in the parking area. That's that's the that's the project that's that's coming forward, so that we have an athletic field that that's available. That's the the side of the property that's that abuts um, a CMP utility right away and the highway. Um, and so, um, and, and we, we went through a thorough search, looked at a number of properties, and we did, you know, in consult consultation with the prior planner here in Scarborough, you know, we picked picked his brain as well about, you know, is this an appropriate location and so forth, you know, and, and so we, you know, we went into the, the, the best education we could as to was this a, you know, was this a, a, an appropriate fit location and so forth. So um, with that, I just want to turn this over to, to Matthew who can walk through the standards and we're available to answer any questions, obviously. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the zoning board. Chair Freelinger, thank you for uh, allowing us to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Matthew Winch. I am the vice chair of the board of directors of the Portland Rugby Club. Also, day job uh, for all uh, candor and, and, and cleanliness, uh, so to speak. I'm also a licensed architect here in Maine, uh, bringing this application uh, on behalf of the Portland Rugby Club. Uh, as, as Andrew said, we've got a long uh, entrenched history here in Southern Maine, and, and um, we have been looking for what we've been labeling as a forever home for quite a long time. Um, this piece of property, or the two properties that we ultimately uh, secured, um, came onto our radar and uh, became a, a, a um, 
really appropriate site for us, um, given the land area that was available and some of the goals that we have uh, for the project itself. Um, I'll touch on the overview of the project really quickly and then get into responding to the uh, technical questions. Um, you can probably jump to the next slide. Um, so you can see here we've established a timeline uh, for our project. We're um, in this phase of um, looking to uh, uh, secure this special use exception. Um, the um, use of fields are uh, conditionally allowable in the zone that we're in. Um, so this is a necessary step for us in the process to gaining uh, ultimately our site plan approval for the uh, uh, property. And you can see sort of our, our imagined timeline here of, of where we think we will land. and. Uh, we are looking to complete some additional fields, uh, field work on the site um, this month and early next month uh, for just some uh, continued monitoring of some uh, vernal pool uh, areas that need, needed a little uh, additional attention. And then is our intent to um, submit and file uh, with Army Corps of uh, Engineers as well as Maine DEP as will be required for development of this um, property. Uh, we're also submitting it to the town of Scarborough, to you tonight, to the uh, planning board when we uh, come before them, to Maine DEP and to Army Corps as a full project. Uh, our rationale behind that is we are, are looking at a long-term vision uh, to, 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 to develop the site, and we are looking to approve the entire master plan uh, for the project. Um, Maine DEP has about a seven year um, statute of limitations on an awarded permit uh, for uh, land use and our intent would be to, um, if everything goes according to our plan, to have a completed three phase project within that seven year approval window from Maine DEP. Um, so I just wanted to give you a little bit of a backdrop as to why you're seeing um, two versions of a plan this evening, the full uh, development plan, and then, um, Brian, if you could switch to the next slide, you'll come to what we see as our phase one. This phase one would be development of a uh, natural grass field um, and parking appropriate for uh, use for that one field of play. Um, we've got a parking allowance that we feel is appropriate for the use at this time. Um, this use would be obviously a playing field um, that would have active players on it as well as spectators and, and, and fans. Based on our uh, typical uh, outpouring of support on a, a Saturday afternoon in Fox Street in Portland, we get a decent crowd um, somewhere between, you know, 50 and 60 uh, for us is a decent crowd. Um, might be a little different for a high school soccer match or what have you, but um, you know we'll have a pretty deep sideline of supporters and players as well. Um, but again, our parking layout here is sort of based on the standards uh, for a field and, and use of this type. Um, we are looking to capture more or less the existing curb cut um, coming off of 122. Uh, two Rod Road, we would also uh, maintain the uh, structures that are already on site. Um, so this is essentially our phase one. Uh, you can see that we are working around some wetland. There would be wetland mitigation uh, associated with this. Um, where Brian is highlighting right now, that is a large pond. Uh, and through Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Review, that pond was determined to um, not be an impingement to our development uh, from the standpoint of environmental standards for vernal pools and what have you, but we are addressing other vernal pools on the site and will address appropriately um, during review and approvals with Army Corps as well as uh, Maine DEP. Um, our second phase, so you can go to the next slide. Sec can I ask a question before I move on to the second phase? Sure. You have to, yeah. What can you? I just can't, couldn't read what was on that. Can you go back, Brian? In the middle of the field, what is that hi highlighted like? Which highlighted piece? I mean, you might what have is to. This lighter green section. What? That is. Uh, sorry. So that is an area. It might not be significant. I just. No, it's it's an area of wetland that we would propose to fill, and we would fill that in accordance with site law with the state of Maine. Um, right now, um, site law uh, allows for a certain amount of wetland fill. Um, we would fill up to that, and if we exceeded the allowable fill um, 
allocations that are given to us, there is a statute by which additional wetlands can be filled either by off-site offsets, um, which one of our potential uh, earthwork subcontractors is working on an off-site um, development site for wetland renewal uh, that would meet main DEP standards, or we would go the route of fee in lieu of, um, which is again another standard uh, determination. If I, you know, it's a difficult site to say, imagine a Walmart there. Um, but if you imagine where the Walmart in Scarborough um, is today, that site was at one point in time a mixed bag of wetlands and forested areas. And um, Walmart would have gone through the same steps that we are going through in our um, environmental reviews. Thank you. Matthew, and again, this is partially just to guide this. Is all of the white um, uh, asphalt concrete hardscape? Or what is the white? Um, entail in, there? Yeah, the, the intent would be for it to be um, paved parking. It's easier to maintain, easier to control the stormwater that's going to be required of the project site. Um, it should be noted as well, and we touch on it in responses to your technical questions, that we are looking at uh, stormwater mitigation that may in fact be placed either under uh, in chambers underneath the parking area or in chambers underneath um, fields that are part of our second phase development. But, but all that white is essentially it's either a pathway or it's a driveway or, or parking lot or something. Correct, a walkway surrounding the field leading to the other fields or the heavier, the, the brighter white lines, uh, yeah, picture them being asphalt in the future, yes. Gotcha. And then the gray versus a, and I'm colorblind, so I apologize for this one. The, um, the gray, uh, the, the two boxes, yep. the three boxes next to the field, are, is there a difference between what the gray and the dark brown are meant to be? Or? I absolutely are. So um, the gray area, the lighter, the lighter of the two grays uh, would be bleachers. We're imagining a, a scoop site where we would actually um, build bleachers into the tapered landscape. And then the uh, second element that you see more or less centered on the field would be part of our phase three, which is a club house, um, so a shower facilities as well as an after match gathering space. And then the last question, on the upper left hand side, you've got sort of some um, uh, uh, coarse hashing. I know the upper right side is a vernal pool currently, but the upper left side, what is that? So there, there, so that is the vernal pool setback area. We are allowed okay, to we are it. allowed to impinge on that uh, to a certain degree. And again, we would do that in conformance with site law. We are also looking at the. It's a tricky balance of, um, uniquely enough, um, to maybe no one's surprise, Army Corps and Maine DEP have slightly different um, measuring sticks as far as what's important to them. One has uh, uh, an eye more on. Uh, vernal pool setbacks, the other has an eye on minimizing wetland impacts. So we're trying to uh, thread a needle, if you will, is to make sure that we're um, addressing both appropriately with both parties. No, that's helpful, just a uh, clarity on the, as we look at the diagrams that go through. So yeah, thanks. yeah, sure. Um, so the next slide, um, we we'll go back to that, is, is really just showing phase two of the vision, which is two additional fields. Um, again, this would be part of our overall approval. Uh, package that we send to Maine DEP. Um, one of the vernal pools that is in question sits in an area that um, we are, that's part of the additional study work that um, GZA Environmental will be going out to do this month and 1st of May to look at a, an area that has been described to me no larger than the size of this uh, dais here, uh, this lectern rather, uh, as far as you know, potential to be a vernal pool. They're gonna study that in the next couple weeks and we will uh, pivot to that accordingly. And obviously we're pivoting based on a number of responses they've given to us um, regarding the, the, the wetland and water features on the site. Um, there is a vernal pool that's attached to the stream network that runs through the site. And we are awaiting further clarification from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife as to whether or not, because the stream has permanent condition to it, it's flowing um, generally throughout the year. So it technically begins to qualify itself as a standing water body, which they treat a little bit differently. So we're waiting for feedback on that as well from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. Um, so the second phase, as you can see, it brings in additional parking because it brings in two additional fields. We are seeing those fields as um, plastic fields, so a uh, manufactured surface similar to what's uh, surrounding the, the inner uh, area of the uh, fields here in Scarborough at the, uh, at the track complex. Um, so those, looks like you're about to ask a question. I was, I didn't want to interrupt No, you're you. fine. Um, fields like that, are they impervious surface? What, 
how, how does water drain off those? So um, it's an interesting question, Kyle. It is considered to be impervious um, in the state of Maine. If we were to drive down to Connecticut and ask the same question, we'd get a different answer. Uh, but obviously, we're here in Maine and not in Connecticut, so we have to adhere to the fact that it's impervious. And that's one of the things that has triggered us into a site law uh, submission with the state of Maine, with, with Maine DEP. Um, that being stated, we are also looking at this field, uh, these two fields, as housing um, storm chamber units. Units. The manufacturers of these turf fields also manufacture pods and chambers that can manage the uh, stormwater that gets attributed to them. So it's not going to be running sheet flowing off the field. It, it will soak into the fabric of the construct of the, of the field itself, and we'll provide details to that during site plan review and what have you. Um, but essentially, uh, because Maine DEP doesn't see it as impervious because they see that water then being channeled out if it's underdrained on a traditional field, which when you add the chambers to it, uh, if it's deemed necessary by our civil engineers, we add the chambers, then it holds the standing water and lets it ebb and flow at a more natural pace as opposed to um, flooding out of, out of the site through any underdrain uh, collection units that might push water at a higher, you know, rap pace than is ideally acceptable to the state of Maine. Um, so these two um, fields would come, like I said, as part of a phase two. We don't know if that would be in year two or year six. Uh, the goal would be somewhere in that uh, parameter, but that really will boil down to um, fundraising on our, on, on our behalf for our own self-interest uh, in seeing this vision completed. Uh, if we only get to uh, phase one and we stop there, uh, we stop there. We are funded enough to get through that. Uh, bit of work and uh, we're hopeful to see this vision uh, follow through to this phase two and then finally to a phase three. Matthew, this will come up on the, um, uh, as we continue to the technical and financial ability. Are we considering all phases for this appeal? Yes. We are. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so phase three uh, would be the clubhouse, and again, I've shown you sort of the, the, the nicer images as opposed to a floor plan of a, uh, a downstairs uh, series of locker rooms, but we're envisioning um, locker rooms to handle, you know, for a full build out, mind you, um, multiple um, guests that might be playing on the three combined fields at any one time uh, during the day. Um, we see this as an opportunity um, to occasionally host larger events that might also be non-rugby related. They might be related to um, soccer or lacrosse or, or what have you if, if there's a need and the town of Scarborough or surrounding communities can't fulfill it, we will do our best to do that as well. That would be part and parcel of our um, business plan. Uh, but this clubhouse, if we only built the first field, and we decided to build a clubhouse and um, put a put a bow on it and call it good enough, then we would build a much smaller um, structure than this as well. This is really, uh, as, as one of our um, club members called it, the extra large t-shirt. Um, this is sort of the full, this is part of the full vision, the full build out of the property. Um, this is, you know, the extent of what we think the most that we could do um, for this project. Uh, and then on the last page is just a financial uh, review of our um, current um, phase, uh, phase one, as well as the pre-construction um, work. Uh, if you look to the middle of the tally columns on the uh, bottom right-hand corner of the sheet, you'll see a total project build-out of about $2.6 million. That includes the soft costs for uh, engineering fees for submission of the full uh, development of the pro property. Um, we've raised, um, it was when I printed this about $625,000, $30,000 uh, that has grown. Our uh, fundraiser is here. He will tell me that that number is higher. We're at $750,000 now raised, uh, which just lowers our um, total project um, end game goal from the 2.016 million or what is there fractionally to, you know, 1.89 or, or what have you. Um, so at this time, uh, giving you this, probably from your perspective, exhaustive overview of the project, uh, we'll move into your sort of technical uh, questions and uh, sort of similar to your past applicants, we're happy to sort of run through them one at a time and review those each with you and uh, give you a necessary feedback where you feel it appropriate. Before we dive into those, I wanted to just give the opportunity to the board to ask general questions. Yeah, uh, proceed. 
Uh, I think I heard you say that there are existing buildings on the property and that you're keeping them. So there are two properties, I should clarify. Um, there are two properties that we purchased. Uh, 122 Two Rod Road uh, is the majority of the land area. It is about 37 acres of land area. Um, you can see on this um, plan here, you will see three parcels. Um, the largest area is the area that Portland Rugby Club owns. If you go up to um, George Cordner, the lighter, nope, down, right there. Um, nope, right above it, sorry. Right above it. Yep, so that, pro that area there is actually part of our purchase area as well. There were some deed discrepancies. We worked with uh, the town assessor to get those cleaned up. We actually own that area as well. There was nothing ever built there. It was a carve out property. Um, when you go d down towards the bottom of the page, you'll see this sort of island sitting in the middle of our property. Uh, that was intended to be a life estate. And that life estate was for the seller of the home, uh, Mr. George Corner, who was um, aging in his home and wanted to live out his years in his home. Um, the uh, property was purchased in June of last year. And um, he, sadly, he died a few weeks after leaving his home to um, be placed in elder care. Uh, so he had his life estate through his end of life, but unfortunately, it was a very uh, short period of time. So that is um, now essentially been taken, the life estate has been removed. Uh, it's still documented here. We can, when we um, apply to the town of Scarborough, I'm sure we'll update that. And then the second pro property that we purchased uh, is just above it, and it's an old log cabin um, that we purchased. It was in um, very poor shape, and uh, there w there's not a feeling that there's much there to save, and we would likely demolish that. Uh, it could also be part of our development plan as far as um, you know, alter alternate location for a field. Our parking is shown there now, so it, it, taking it down becomes necessary to our development plan. Uh, but the original coroner house and the garage uh, that was part of that life estate is remaining today, and it's our intent to keep that, to use that as a building f for storage of stuff. Uh, it's got a dwelling unit in it. We still plan to maintain the dwelling unit. Um, you know, we've, we're going to have needs for maintenance equipment and whatnot, so the garage is the perfect thing. It's already sitting there. Why rebuild something new? So we want to maintain uh, those two structures, but the log cabin uh, would go away. Mrs. Snow. Thank you. Uh, not, a, not a question for you, sir, but um, just for the, for the board to understand this, we are not really getting into the weeds of you know, the, the complete building plan because that's for the planning board uh, through the three stages that you've outlined. Uh, our mission tonight is simply to consider whether or not we should grant a, a special exception, you know, for this use in this area. That's it, you know, in the complete area that you've defined. Yeah. Um, and we really should not, you know, get into any of the, uh, the details that are the responsibility of the planning board. Yeah, no, and, and we appreciate that. We wanted to give as thorough and as full. And it's good to know all of that background, but at the same time, um, I just want to make sure that as a board, you know, that we stick to what our yeah. job is. Absolutely. That's sort of a related point, point to that one, too. Um, and it's a question that... I almost want just for the record, and we won't go further with it. Have, have you worked with the Parks and Recreation Committee um, on the Parks and Recreation Master Plan and how this fits into this town's master plan for ultimately its development of park and recreational facilities? No, we have not. Okay, got it. Fair enough. Again, that's not our purview. It's just more of a question. Um, and then the I'll get to the traffic question in a bit because there's been some issues on Two Rod Road, which have come up separately. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, and then, um, yeah, I think that's that that, that that's it for me. So, uh, anything? I just had another quick question. Could, would the, can you talk about lighting on the fields? What the plan is? Yeah, so we do plan on, uh, and I think we touch on that later in the standards, but we can speak to that now. We do plan on um, lighting the first field uh, absolutely as part of phase one. Uh, that will be done with uh, low energy consuming LED cutoff lighting. Um, we've come a long way with technology, and from lighting on timers to um, lighting that is designed to illuminate a field and not illuminate the area adjacent to it, uh, we will be investing in that. One of our donors is actually. Um, a, a, man, a project manager for ES Bolas will likely be our electrical um, contractor for, for an obvious reason. Um, but I will say 
personally as a Portland resident. Um, we've got a, another one here uh, in our audience with us that I know of. Um, drives me nuts as a taxpayer when I drive by <laughs> Hadlock Field and the lights are still on. Um, so, you know, from the standpoint of paying the electric bill, the electric bill's on us. We want to <laughs> make sure the lights are off and, and uh, also being uh, in harmony, if you will, with the, uh, the, with the surrounding environment. Any other general questions before we dive into the um, standards? Okay. Um, if you stay with us, uh, Matthew, we'll go through this and um, we'll ask you to read, read uh, the, materially read the items on your responses to the standards. And then if we have any questions from the board for any of these, please just um, raise your hands, folks. The proposed use, um, first standard A, the proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reasons of sewage disposal, emissions to the air, water, or other aspects of its design or operation. Yes, so our response, the overall master plan of three phases for the development of the property includes a small clubhouse that will have a full bathroom, changing room, showering facilities, along with other bathrooms for guest use. In addition, we're proposing a secondary building that would uh, house additional bathrooms located off the parking lots that will serve uh, the fields developed under phase two. These facilities will all be tied to an on-site septic system designed to handle the fixture counts and use type. It should be noted that until the project is fully developed, the use of porta toilets will be used. We will contract with a servicer who will make scheduled visits to pump out all effluent and trucked off site to proper waste management facilities. The current buildings that you said that you were going to maintain, those are already on septic, presumably? Correct. They're on um, septic on drilled well water, and uh, it, there is electricity to the site. Okay. Any other questions? Will this be a new septic system installed? It will have to be a new septic system installed, yes. Yep. Assume that, but yep. I want to make sure. Any other questions? No. Okay, the proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Uh, current vehicular traffic is being studied by the Sewell Company, and there are no known impacts that the proposed project would present. Given the vicinity of the property of the former Beach Ridge Motor Speedway, we expect that the traffic impact would be negligible compared to the trips generated on race days and nights. Two Rod Road is not a typically pedestrian route, and we do not anticipate any pedestrian foot traffic to or from the property. Gotcha. The one point I'll, I'll raise here, um, and, and this is not necessarily directly in the purview, but I'm on the Long Range Planning Committee, which has received a request from um, members of Kennebago Road and um, and other folks off of the <coughs> the um, the shore side of the uh, the Turnpike for um, uh, traffic slowing um, uh, um, uh, implements on Two Rod Road. So have have you implemented? Have you envisioned any of that on this, or is this part of that? Have you had any conversations with the town or the transportation committee on that? No. We had an early meeting with the town back in October of last year. We brought our transportation engineer to that meeting. She summarized in general terms what she felt was going to be the light impact, but had not gotten into the study of much. She's also um, studying traffic impacts of the redevelopment of uh, Beechridge Motor Speedway, and we feel that we are going to be a minor concern um, in comparison to that. Um, that being stated, we know that Two Rod Road is a 25 mile an hour zone from Payne Road to just before the overpass. We're in support of that. We don't mind that one bit. We want to be responsible members of the community when we're driving to and from the field. Uh, and we want our guests to and from, uh, you know, parents that might come for a child's athletic event. We, we would make absolutely certain that everyone's aware of what the speed limits are. And if the town were to install speed tables, um, that would be, you know, a measure that we wouldn't have an issue with because, again, we support the lower speed limit there. And you have been in conversation with the town. Again, the foreseeable activity obviously could potentially be the redevelopment of the, of the, um, the Beechridge uh, speed, speed, Speedway site, which would have truck traffic and other sort of potential um, increases in volume. But you've, you've incorporated that in your thinking and that is being incorporated into your traffic studies or at least as contingencies in your traffic studies. Yeah, I might ask Andrew to speak to that more directly, um, but from the conversations that we've had, um, our impacts are being um, considered as they relate to traffic on Two Rod Road, and obviously there is a bearing and a weight and an impact of, a, of another development that we're not a part of, uh, but we're focused on our impact sure. uh, specifically to the site, which sure. is, uh, again, minimal trips. Okay, understood. Any other questions on that one? Okay. Item C, the proposed use will not create 
public uh, will not create public safety problems, which will be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood, or require a substantially greater degree of municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. Correct. The pro <clears throat> excuse me. The proposed project would not create any significant police or fire department protection. Facilities will be monitored by an operations team during events or regularly scheduled practices. During match day rugby events, there will be a doctor on the premises. It's a requirement of our league play. Um, sorry, lost my place. And renters will be required to have similar coverage for any events or tournaments hosted at the facility. We expect the burdens on local police and fire will be substantially less than the impacts of Beach Ridge Motor Speedway or Scarborough Downs historically were. Um, I will just add uh, a little side note to that. The building itself will be likely be required to sprink be sprinkled. And so that would be um, in adherence with town codes as well for the stand from the standpoint of fire safety. Any questions on that? Uh, item D, the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or will have an adverse effect on water supplies. And you've gone over this a bit, but if you could. Yeah, yeah. For, for the record, the property is not part of any significant watershed or water body. A very small stream runs through the site. It will be preserved per DEP standards. The facilities will also be designed such that sedimentation and erosion are mitigated or prevented. Stormwater chambers will be used along with retention ponds as necessary to meet the environmental criteria of state and federal agencies. So this is not within in any of the identified um, uh, uh, endangered um, watersheds that are in this in that northeast corner. It of the is. Scarborough? It is not identified as an impaired stream. It is not identified as anything other than a um, a, a culvert that crosses one side of Two Rod Road, enters through our property, and makes its way down to another um, outsource. Terrific. Thanks. Any other questions on that? Where would the retention ponds be on the site? So when we wrote this, we were debating whether or not we do retention ponds or under under um, facility chambers, and we're likely going to be doing the, the, the chambers because finding, as you can see, finding a spot for a retention pond would impact the existing wetlands. So we're looking at, again, to mitigate the expense of gobbling up wetlands, we'll, pl we'll place things under fields or under parking lots. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Uh, the use and development of the playing fields and clubhouse will be compatible and to similar uses in the immediate area. The playing fields can be compared to the former Beach Ridge Motor Speedway or a local golf course. The development would impact far smaller areas than both uh, of those uses um, and would also bring less vehicular traffic when compared to both. Visually, the fields are primarily screened from Two Rod Road. One parking lot may be partially visible from Two Rod Road, but others will be shielded by existing tree cover or the natural topography of the existing parcels. The overall goal of the project is to have as few impacts as possible to the surrounding area as possible. The natural layout avoiding wetland impacts has also been the benefit of maintaining the trees throughout the property, therefore avoiding a single intensity of impervious surface to the project. And I'll just add a comment that Andrew had made to me earlier this week um, that you know one of the the things that we like about this property is it does allow us to spread things out, um, be a little bit more sort of agrarian as Maine is, um, as, as opposed to having things compacted together. We've seen similar um, complexes where the fields are tightly knit together and we want to uh, avoid that uh, for a lot of reasons. Questions from board members? I have one and um, it's not on here because it's obviously not on here, but north of um, Holmes Road on this is the uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the gun club, the yes. Scarborough Gun Club. Um, we've gotten some feedback in different forums from residents of Kennebago Road that they're already feeling squeezed in. Um, have you had any reach out to the Kennebago Road community or, or, or talk to them about this? I mean, compared to what they've already faced with the gun club and what they had for the Beach Ridge Speedway, this is a much different kind of use, but I'm just wondering if there's been any reach out from a neighborhood perspective to the residents there. We have not reached out to the neighborhoods. We didn't know that it was Kennebago Street specifically. We were made aware that there had been complaints that were raised specifically to the Rod and Gun Club and that ironically that the noise issues with Beach Ridge Motor Speedway were less obtrusive to people. Um, from a sound standpoint, um, the cer most certainly with our first phase development, um, the, if, if you can hear us above the din of you know passing traffic on the main turnpike, uh, you know, Good luck to you. We practice on occasion at Fitzpatrick Stadium in Portland, which is um, on an urban corridor as well. And you have to speak at a 
level higher so that people on the field can hear you barking instructions so we don't expect um, noise to be uh, any type of an issue. Yeah. I, like I said, I, I bring it just because I know the town in various forums has heard feedback from that community. And, yep. um, and But understand it's a different, what you're doing is different than um, yeah. Uh, a, yeah. a firing uh, range. Yeah, a rugby whistle is called the thunderer, but if you can hear it for a long distance, I would be absolutely surprised. <laughs> Is the if located in a shoreland zone as depicted on the town of Scarborough official shoreland zoning map? Um, uh, again, and we'll turn to Brian on this one from staff. Is it in a shoreland zone? I think, if I remember correctly, and I didn't look at this before tonight, and I can't remember if that is worth I think it's a NERPA stream. There's a stream running through the property. I don't think it's under our stream protection. It is not. No, we're not in a shoreland. It's not in the shoreland. So yeah. I think the wetland impacts. Yeah, he's. Turn my mic on while I said all that. I don't believe it. There is a shoreland zoning issue there. I think it's a Natural Resource Protection Act stream. If, if it's regulated at all, and and then the wetland impacts would be regulated, but not under shoreland. Um, the applicant has a sufficient right, title, or interest in the site of the proposed use to be able to carry out the proposed use. We provided a deed with our application. Any questions or issues with that? Uh, the applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Uh, the Portland Rugby Club has the technical and financial means to carry out this work. On the technical side, the Applicant's Development Committee is a collection of, of uh, development professionals that are managing the project. The applicant has engaged the Sewell Company, as we referenced earlier, for engineering and permitting services, as well as G GZA, Geoenvironmental for all wetlands environmental services. As evidenced by the, uh, our, a bit, our uh, excuse me, <laughs> trying to speak in the third person and the first person at one time. As evidenced by our ability to purchase the properties of 122, 140, and 142, 2 Rod Road, the applicant has raised the adequate capital resources and funding to purchase the properties, complete planning and permitting work, and has the financial commitments through phase one of the project. Subsequent phases will be funded in a similar way, but may also include bank financing. Nope. Seeing none. Uh, the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to the generation of noise and hours of operation. Um, we envision hours of operation to vary um, by the day of the week, also the time of year, obviously. Most weekdays, Monday through Friday, would see usage times. Um, uh, and, and I want to take a step back and, and say we're paraphrasing here of a full developed and built out um, project because our use needs as a single entity would be slightly different than if we were uh, marketing this to other use groups and so we've identified at least what we feel would be a typical impact if we were uh, operating three full fields. Um, so an average use times of an average about 3.30 to 10 o'clock at night. This would not be every night, but those are the anticipated hours that we would make the facilities available to public sports groups to rent the facilities for practices and matches of their own. Uh, these would all be scheduled around the Portland Rugby Club's primary use times of Tuesday and Thursday evenings between 5.30 and 9. On the weekends, we imagine more use of the facilities between 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. Again, this will be dictated by actual use, but these are the hours we see the facilities being available for use. The noise generated by the field use would be quite minimal when compared to the Beach Ridge Motor Speedway or the Rod and Gun Club. In fact, it's highly unlikely that any noise of the players in the field or fans in the Bleach Ridge would rise above the din of ongoing traffic from the adjacent main turnpike. Any questions, any comments? Okay. Just a comment. Sure. sure. Uh, the, from what I can see, the development will be well wooded, which will absorb um, a lot of the, some of the noise that will be generated. Absolutely, yeah. And um, the other comment I would make is that the amount of noise that uh, was generated by Beach Ridge was certainly far um, in excess of this, and that there are already noise ordinances um, in effect in the uh, town of Scarborough, uh, which would um, be a, a recourse in case of um, any uh, establishment exceeding, you know, what those uh, statutory limits are. Uh, so I, I just don't see where this, this would be a, a, an issue whatsoever. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chair, I don't know if anyone, uh, 
I don't, I don't know if it was addressed in the application or not, I can't remember. But I, I believe this is more of a seasonal use as well, right? Probably not a lot of activity through the winter months, I'm guessing. That, that's correct. You know, there's there is a growing need for field use even in the winter months. Um, you know, anecdotally, there are soccer clubs that practice indoors that would love to be outdoors if we had the ability to clear a field and use it during the winter time. We certainly wouldn't uh, pass up that opportunity if it were to our financial advantage, meaning clearing the field, the cost of clearing the field for for use in February versus you know not clearing it would have to be weighed. Could you tell me the size of the three built-out parking lots? I can't off the top of my head. Um, I can say that a, a, a rugby or a soccer field is about 2.17 acres. And just looking at... How much oh, parking spaces. Parking right. spaces in the built-out lots, They're yeah. Noted on the plans. Um, so we are looking at full development, uh, 88 plus 88 plus... So we are looking on the order of magnitude. That's about, sorry, I'm doing some quick math in my head here. Estimates, fine. 250. And 250, it looks like in three separate, or three, three and a half separate areas. Correct, well. in, three, in three different, in, principally in three different areas with, uh, at present time, three different curb cuts. Okay. Two existing curb cuts and then one added curb cut. So you would keep these plowed in, in the winter? Again, that will become a financial decision on our part if there's a viable use um, during the winter. And this, again, is being hypothetical because <laughs> phase two is the development of a field that would be usable in the wintertime. We wouldn't uh, want to impair the use of a grass field by trying to use it in the wintertime and uh, causing damage to something that we've worked so hard to, to, to create. So that would principally be one or two of the um, phase two fields um, looking down the road in the future. We, we may be in a situation where we pay, uh, plow the access up to our storage building on the lower half of the property and then pay, uh, plow a portion of the parking lots um, at the other fields uh, based on use and need. But again, it's at, at this point in time because we're um, principally focused on Field number one, we don't see that being used in the wintertime, just the addition of the other fields. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and you're maintaining a housing unit on the property? Will that be lived in year round? No, not at this time. We are maintaining it because it's a legal dwelling unit and we saw no benefit to taking it down. Uh, so we will maintain it as a legal dwelling unit. So there is potential, but it's not in our plans right now. Um, because if you look at the proximity of a large playing field <clears throat> to that uh, residential um, structure, it's, it's not an ideal um, home for somebody. Okay. <laughs> okay, if that's, that will close your discussion of the items, I'll open the floor up to any public comment and ask staff if we've received any additional public comment or phone calls or anything since we last got our packet. I have not received any phone calls or written comments. Gotcha. And is there anyone from the public who wish, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That's all right. Was Canabago apprised of the, So are they abutters? <clears throat> so based on our, our parameters for who we contact as far as the distance out we, we plot out in any 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 properties that are touched by I, is it five immediate uh, what's the what's yeah, the well, company within a hundred feet of the property boundaries mm -hmm. so we're basically contacting the direct abutters and people across the street it didn't touch the Kennebago neighborhood no. so okay so and is there it okay go ahead is there anyone from the public who wishes to speak in the audience? Okay, fair enough. At that point, at this point then, I will close the, uh, the, the forum to public comment and we can enter our deliberations as a committee. Um, are there any general comments before we go through findings of fact and, uh, and the um, meanings of the standards? Nope, okay, well, fire right in then. Um, 
Again, we'll do the same thing that we did before. I'll, I'll ask um, a member of the board to um, summarize their, their views and summarize facts that we could agree upon and then open it up for discussion. So, and we'll just uh, go down the, 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 the row. The proposed use will not create unsanitary or unhealthful conditions by reasons of sewage disposal, emissions to the air or water, or other aspects of its design or operations. Uh, Christine, oh, and, yeah, Matt, I was going to say you can take a seat too. So, um, but Christine, could you start us off on that one? Sure. Uh, they'll be having uh, professionals design their runoff and sewage and um, uh, runoff on the property, runoff from the fields, runoff from the parking lots. Uh, so they're addressing it with professional designs. Um, do we feel? Do you feel that we've met that they've met the standard then um, for? I, I am very interested in what they find out from the DEP and, um, uh, in, you know, in the um, Army Corps of Engineers. I'm, it, I'm very pleased to hear you working with them and addressing what you know is there, and I hope you can. Yeah. I would just add, I, 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 think, I do think that the, that first criteria is geared more towards sort of health you know, sanitary sewage type issues. Um, I, I think that um, we should find, make a finding of fact that the proposed use will not cause any unhealthful or unsanitary conditions. Um, it would be served by a to be designed, to be built um, septic system on site. So I, I don't see any concerns. I, I, I agree, and this speaks to the, the, I think the, we'll get to this later, but I think the applicant is demonstrating, number one, a professional approach to the site development, which would include the development and siting of septic fields and, and, and the like, um, and also includes the financial wherewithal to ensure that those are installed properly. So, um, so do we feel comfortable about that? Can I ask for a, a show of hands to, to, that we agree this has been met on that, those facts? Terrific. The proposed use will not create unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Um, Michelle. Yeah, um, it, it does look like that they're adding a lot of parking spaces and with the full three phases, there will be um, quite a number of people at any given time if it was all full. Um, causing there to be lots more vehicular uh, traffic, but unsafe, it looks like, I, I would say no. Um, you know, it looks like they've thought out the different entrances with the different parking lots. They've even made some pathways for pedestrians to move throughout the spaces. Um, I think that they've met this condition and have thought that proposal through. Any other thoughts on that? David? I, I think during the next stage, uh, should this be approved, the planning board will do diligence on yeah. this issue, and we really shouldn't get any further into it. I agree. Carol, anything from you? Nope. Make sure. Okay. Um, I, I agree, and, and I think as we talk about whether it's stipulations or the like on this one, um, I think we will want to direct the planning committee to view a number of things in particular but they do, that, that's the planning board's role. Um, I agree, David. So um, I, I think we're gonna, if we agree on those findings of fact and, and agree on that approach, can I see a show of hands of seeing that this one has been met? Terrific. The proposed use will not create public safety problems which would be substantially different from those created by existing uses in the neighborhood or require a substantially greater degree in municipal fire or police protection than existing uses in the neighborhood. David. Uh, well, a couple of things here. First of all, they're going to, um, uh, in Sprinkler, the, the clubhouse and, you know, the facilities that uh, should be sprinklered uh, to code. Uh, and that's, you uh, uh, certainly will uh, minimize any kind of uh, potential problems. Uh, and the other thing, too, is that, um, you know, this, the particular use that they, they have uh, will, will not significantly impact the need for fire or police protection. And in fact, they are also requiring, you know, through their regulations, um, to have a doctor on, on premises for every event. Uh, so that will certainly uh, help to 
uh, provide uh, immediate attention you know, for those in need. Other than the inherent um, insanity of playing rugby, um, there's, uh, um, yeah, I, I think that's been summarized well, and they, I'm glad that they recognize the need for a doctor and, and perhaps more than that um, for any event involving a scrum. But, um, yeah, I think that is well stated, David, and if there's no objections, I think this has been met. Could I see a show of hands if we agree? Terrific, well, that one is met. The proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. Um, I'll take this one. Um, I, I think the applicant has demonstrated that they are fully aware of and working with DEP um, and uh, Army Corps of Engineers um, and the town to ensure that, um, that, they are, that they are eliminating the effects of sedimentation and erosion in line with uh, um, uh, appropriate regulation. Obviously, when you're talking about filling in wetlands um, or, uh, or, or making changes to, store, to, to stormwater drainage, there is an effect on sedimentation or erosion, but nevertheless, they are clearly taking proactive steps um, and, uh, to, to think about the best and most appropriate way to preserve the, um, the, the, the water resources on the property and the wetlands um, uh, in, 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 in the surrounding area. So um, I think we can find that while there may be an effect, um, a, a, an effect on sedimentation or erosion, um, they are meeting it well within the, um, the, the allowable standards of state, federal, and local um, uh, regulation. And therefore, I would argue that they have met the standard, this standard. Um, are there any other? Uh, well, I would just chime in. I think, I think if, if we, we need to make a finding that the proposed use will not result in sedimentation or erosion, full stop, mm -hmm. rather than use like a de minimis or acceptable level. So I think that we should just make clear that, you know, if we think that this requirement is met, that we, we just make a factual finding that there, that we do not believe this proposed use will result in sedimentation or erosion or have an adverse effect on water supplies. And, and I guess the, 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 what I have on this one is, we'll have an adverse effect. Um, on a certain level, um, leaving the property as it is will result in sedimentation and erosion. So I, 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 that, that element of, the, of this standard always bothers me um, because nature s deposits sediment, sediment and then erodes it from itself. Um, but, uh, but the adverse effect here, I think, is the critical element, and I think we can find that this proposal is not creating an adverse effect. Mr. Chair, uh, I would add that I think, I think the way to look at this, too, is in context of will the proposed use result in that sedimentation and right. erosion? Thinking of all of the various special exception uses that are out there, is this one one that's creating sedimentation and erosion? knowing full well that during construction, sedimentation and erosion controls will be in place. Yeah. The site will be monitored during construction by staff and third party reviewers as part of this, the site plan review process and conditions of approval. So yeah, there's always that potential during construction and stuff, but once the, once the construction is completed and everything is stabilized and in place, will this use be a, a, a sedimentation and erosion yeah. generator? That's the way you have to look at it. And I, that, that's, a, that's a helpful clarification, Ryan, and I appreciate that because I think what has been proposed in terms of, um, of uh, stormwater storage and, uh, and, and drainage mitigation and all the rest certainly does represent, no, this is not going to create those erosion or sedimentation impacts um, other than, to your point, what would naturally occur during the construction phase of any project. So. Yeah, I, I think the criteria is met. I mean, they're, they're clearly they're doing it right. You know, based on the representations we heard tonight, all the federal and state agencies are involved in the permitting. So I feel comfortable finding this criteria okay. is met. Any other discussion from the folks on this side? Great. Okay, if I can see by show of hands agreement to that, those, that, that finding of fact and that the statement has been met. Terrific. The proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, intensity of use, proximity to other structures, and density of development. Kyle, this one's to you. Well, I propose that we make a finding of fact that the proposed use um, will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood um, because the, um, 
the fields will be a little distance off of the road. The parking lots will be a little distance off of the road. Um, there will be a pretty minimal visual impact that I and, and intensity of use um, that I don't think would be incompatible with existing uses in the neighborhood. Any other thoughts? Michelle? I would add too that there is a mix of businesses and houses in the neighborhood. So this and fields for shooting guns, those yeah. kinds of things. So. Um, yeah, it, I don't see this being, uh, you know, sticking out. Great. And I, I would actually, it involves the, the, the Rod and Gun Club. I think it's, there are other somewhat intensive recreational uses in the neighborhood that have really become part of the fabric of that part of Holmes Road and, and Two Rod Road and the rest. So um, I, I, I would agree, and I think we could find easily that this one has been met on those facts. So if we agree on that one, I'll, um, we'll see that by show of hands. Terrific. And if located in a shoreland zone, again, we turn to Brian. This is not in a shoreland zone, but potentially there are other wetland issues that we've talked about, but not in a shoreland zone. So we'll agree to that by show of hands real quick. Thank you. The applicant has sufficient right title or interest in the site and the proposed use to be able to carry out the pro proposed use. Um, I believe the applicant has attached the deed and has demonstrated a right and title um, in line with the ability to further develop the site. So um, on that, I think we have an adequate finding of fact. If we can see a show of hands. The applicant has a technical and financial ability to meet the standards of this section and to comply with any conditions imposed by the Board of Appeals pursuant to subsection 5 of this section. Um, David? Uh, this again, this particular neighborhood is kind of a mixed use area, and uh, you know, with the former Beach Ridge uh, Speedway there, uh, as well as the Rod and Gud Club, um, and, and just the proximity to the interstate, uh, you know, noise generation in general is a higher level area. Uh, but what they're not really doing anything that's um, in excess of what's already there, um, and um, in addition to that, I would um, say that. Um, their hours of operation, even though 10 o'clock may seem like a late time for weekdays, for that particular neighborhood, it's really not. Great. You know, if this were a pure residential area and you put it right there in a residential area, I say, well, no, I don't think that would work too well. But, um, you know, in this particular area, I think it uh, is not a problem whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Which one are we talking about? Yeah, I was, yeah you, you skipped over to I. I do think that. Which is fine. We can go back to H. Um, I, think, I think Mr. We should adopt Mr. Bork's proposed findings for for criteria I. I agree. It was I aptly stated. Agree. Completely agree. Show of hands for I. Ms. Stone, are you okay with I? I am. And if, and it's a big petition. I'm still trying to digest it, but um, I do think it has. A, I think it has a big impact on the neighborhood. Um, and I am worried about the hours. And how does the town, I mean, will the planning board be regulating the hours that they can operate? We're not approving the 10, 10 p.m. You know, the, the, and, and, and one thing, Christina, and, and um, first off, why don't we register that as four to one for I, um, for I, and I think that's fine. Um, I do wanna, as we go to the final um, consideration of this, think of some, um, not necessarily uh, requirements, but um, but requests of the, of the planning board, because I think that will come up. So we'll register you as a as, as a dissenter on on I. We'll go back to H. We still have to go back to H. Um, but um, we'll uh, um, but thank you, Christine. We'll, we'll we'll make sure that's noted. Now back to H. The applicant has the technical and financial ability to meet the standards of the section. It, and to comply with any condition, it's okay. Yeah, I'm imposed by the Board of Appeals, sub pursuant to subsection five of the section. Kyle, can you help us on that one? Oh, sure. Yeah, um, I, I think that the financial um, information they've provided is part of the record, um, and I think that that aptly um, represents that uh, this organization has the financial and technical ability to um, complete the project as proposed. They've retained. Um, reputable consultants, engineers, surveyors. So I think that um, this criteria is met. 
Agreed. I'll also add that um, this has been um, a phased project. Phase one clearly has been met, and um, the applicant will be working with the planning board on whether bank financing will be required and what that might mean from a risk perspective going forward. But phase one, I think, has been more than adequately demonstrated, so we're, we're fine on that one. If we can find those facts, and um, are we in agreement on H, by show of hands, we are. Terrific. Um, so that gets the standards. Um, do we have, um, uh, what do we have, uh, the um, performance standards for, for this one? No, there's no performance standards. Okay, it's got it. That's what I was looking for. Okay, um, then on that basis, um, I will, um, I think we will entertain a motion to approve the appeal. Well, can I ask, sure. Mr. Chairman? Oh, can I, I, excuse me. Yeah. I, I misspoke. There actually is performance standards. Uh, that are in Section uh, 9U. Um, they're fairly general in nature, and that would have to be, you know, be met during the site plan review portion of it. I don't know that I provided you with a yeah. copy of those. No. Um, yes, I did. Come on. Read the notes. I worked hard at this. It's, in, it's on the back page of my staff comments. Okay. Last page. Performance standards you. I need to get, get Come on, give me some credit. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, well, let me read these and we can, um, uh, and I'll ask for a discussion. I forgot I, I, forgot I put them in there. <laughs> the primary recreational activity must occur in the outdoors. I think they meant that. Yes. Structural development must be limited to facilities and buildings that support the primary recreational activity and shall be the minimum necessary to accommodate the youth. Uh, use. Buildings or structures may not be or house the primary recreational activity. Examples of allowed buildings and structures include maintenance and storage buildings, an office related to the use, restrooms, an equipment rental building, a warming hut or clubhouse, and for facilities for the sale of refreshments to people using the facility. I'll note that we did not hear about refreshments, but otherwise, um, I believe <laughs> um, th th this is an interesting one because there is the existing house on the property, which is a dwelling unit. Um, and I'll ask actually how that would be considered given that it is an existing building. Um, would they be required on this performance standard to take out that building? Or could that be deemed, a prop, for example, an allowable building? They've already stated that they intend to use the garage for storage. Of the garage makes, yeah, the garage. Uh, and, and I assume the house could also be converted for other uses accessory to the principal use of commercial. Gotcha. I feel that this is bad. I just wanted to highlight that and ask the committee if they had any issues on that. OK. So by show of hands, they've met that, presumably? Yes. All buildings, facilities, and areas used for recreation activities must conform to the setbacks for the district in which it was located. Um, again, based on the diagrams that we saw here, I didn't see any setback issues. Um, Brian, I, I, it, some of these were kind of tight, but it, it, it all looked by scale to be well within setbacks. Yeah, I mean, what, what are the setbacks for this zone? Well, the, the front setback would be 50 feet. But that, but you're talking about structures, not fields. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Fields are not structures. Yeah. Fields are not structures. Yeah. Yeah. So and, that's and, the thing. And again, yeah. the whole site configuration will be part of a site plan review. Should the board approve the special exception, all of that stuff yeah. will be uh, vetted through. This is a, pro, you know, this is a, uh, this is a conceptual plan. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, yeah, Dave, if you yeah, it's a conceptual plan that Sewell Associates have shown a five foot buffer around the uh, perimeter of the property, which is the, um, that is the line by which our fields could not cross. Gotcha. And the, and the curb cuts and that will all be subject to final site plan analysis and all the rest. Curb cuts would all be as yes, absolutely okay. subject to, we're trying to reuse two of them for that specific purpose, but the third one would be subject to approval. Yep. Okay. So on that basis, and thank you for the, uh, for the clarification there, I think we, that they've demonstrated that they've met the setback requirements for, the, for this. Are there any questions from the board? Then by show of hands. Thank you. The use must provide adequate off-street parking that is appropriate for the anticipated use of the facility that will prevent the parking of vehicles along public roads. Any concerns with the parking that's been shown? Again, with respect to this, it will prevent parking on the road. That is the performance standard. So with agreement, by show of hands. Thank you. 
If the use will operate on a regular basis, an improved parking lot must be provided. Um, I believe that's been demonstrated in the site plan. So by show of hands real quick, thank you. If the use will operate intermittently, uh, we've already said that. that. Um, the recreational activity must not create any adverse impacts for a budding property as a result of noise or odors. Um, with due respect to the members of the rugby community, um, the, uh, I, I don't believe, again, there, there's a lot of forest that they left on here, a lot of buffer. Um, I think. Uh, Have you ever swelled, uh, smelled sweaty cleats? That's why I'm. <laughs> Not getting there within a 10 foot pole, as they say. So, uh, but uh, I think they've met that that we can uh, raise. I uh, see that by a show of hands. Thank you. Okay, so the performance standards um, have been met. On that, um, I will entertain a motion to approve the appeal. So Ms. moved. And a second. I'll second it. Thanks, Michelle. A second, Michelle seconds. Um, and now a discussion on the appeal. And if there are any conditions, we want to refer up to the planning board, or if not conditions, then d discussion points or recommendations um, to the planning board. If this were, if we do approve this, I'd like to understand Christy. what the planning board. So they'll be looking at hours, and that, are we approving hours till 10 p.m.? You're approving the use. You're approving, you're approving the use based on the information provided to you. You have the purview to place conditions on that approval. You could effectively place a condition on the, on the hours. The planning board, I don't know that they're necessarily looking at hours. They're looking at the site plan itself, stormwater management, parking, uh, traffic, issues, those kinds of things. I'm, I honestly don't know that they look at hours of operation necessarily. And there is a nor noise ordinance. I don't know yes. what it is exactly. I'm not really a rowdy person in general, but uh, I assume they have to <laughs> adhere to those ordinances and, um, you know, 10 p.m. is probably what it is. So, um, you know, I think they provided a fairly adequate uh, range of what it could be. But if they go beyond that, their neighbors have every right to call the police if they need to, I guess. I will say, I don't see any harm in putting a condition um, on lighting or noise you know, past a certain time. I don't either. I, I, I agree with that. And, um, and if, if, if 10 p.m. is a hard limit, then that's something we should Potentially put as a condition of use. Well, Mr. Chair, I just you know, 10 p.m. is is in the in the good neighbor ordinance for noise that leaves the property mm -hmm. line, right? But I think we've already established that there's buffering, yeah, and there's traffic noise that will will be greater than the noise created on the field. So no, I I, 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 I just caution the board to be careful. Don't rope something in where you don't have. I don't know that you have any hard proof that that's going to be a detriment. If they play till midnight, is that going to be a detriment? No, what I'm thinking is if they play until 10, they're driving off the property until 1030, for example. And that might be part of what is driving um, uh, uh, Christine's concern. Or potentially, I'm not saying it is. But so are we going to shut down Two Rod Road after 10 o'clock? Well, that, that, that gets to a separate one, which I'd like to have as a condition of this a... Um, a, a, a I, we've heard in other forums in town that Two Rod Road is becoming a more uh, a thoroughfare of concern, shall I say. Um, uh, and that's coming from both through traffic and the potential for traffic at all hours due to the potential development of the, the Beach Ridge Speedway on the site. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't, I'm not sure what condition to establish on this one, but, and, and Kyle, you're good at kind of coming up with these, but I think some, something to, to some condition regarding integration with transportation committee or the planning committee's um, ongoing assessment of traffic conditions on Two Rod Road, I think is an important one. Um, and then the other one I'd like to have just to really check the box came up earlier. I don't think this is a, 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 an onerous one, but I'd like to refer this to the parks committee um, because they have just had a parks master plan that they spent a lot of money getting approved and just give them the opportunity to understand how this would, would or would not integrate with their master planning concepts for, for the town. 
Um, I think that's a courtesy if nothing else. And if we, if the planning board doesn't do it, then we shouldn't um, be discourteous as a committee and not do that. So that th those are the two that came up for me. I don't want to put personally a condition on them to not go forward just because we want to like for the parks part. Okay. I think that would be nice if they showed it to the parks department, but okay. like, I don't know. They're spending their own money to, to do this. I, I don't think that we need to put that condition that they can't move forward or anything with it, but that's Yeah, I worry that maybe we wouldn't have a basis for it since it's untethered to a particular <laughs> criteria. I, I mean, it's a good idea. And, and I would encourage the, the applicant to do that. Yeah. But I just worry we, don't, we wouldn't have a hook to any of the mm -hmm. criteria that we're supposed to evaluate to do that. I'm good with that. Maybe, maybe we could ask the applicants, could you please reach out to the Parks Department and the Parks Committee, again, as a good future member of the Scarborough community? Um, again, they, literally within the last 30 days, they approved the Parks Master Plan for the community, and I'm sure they would want to have that, they would love to have that information from you guys as, as a consideration. Just so that they can see if they want yeah, to exactly. anything around on their end, yeah. not for you guys to do Correct, that. yeah. We, we'd be happy to do that. And Brian, maybe if you can send me a copy, uh, send us a copy of the approved master plan that they brought forward, then we can um, then reach out and contact them. That'd be great. And it's a spirit welcome to Scarborough on a certain level, um, and we'd love you to help us build the best Scarborough we can. So, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Back to, back to the issue of uh, 10 o'clock and noise. Uh, we, we have existing ordinance in the town of Scarborough regarding this. And I don't think it's appropriate for us to encumber you know, this approval with any kind of restrictions in that regard because it's already there. It's not really necessary for us to create any kind of conditions. Mr. On Chair, if I could that's add. Already regulated. And thank you. I, if I could add to Mr. Bork's comment too. I mean, if a contest is going on, let's say it's a soccer game, and they run into overtime, mm -hmm. you can't stop the shot soccer game because it's 10 o'clock and the town doesn't want you to play anymore. They do in Boston. Yeah. <laughs> Where in Boston? <laughs> you ever watch the Sox? What, it, it, exactly. At 2, p, at 2 a.m. you got to stop the Sox game. Well, that's 2 a.m. <laughs> True. I mean, I <laughs> you shouldn't I'm, be I'm playing just, baseball just, at 2 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Different issue entirely. Um, I just feel like that may be an unreasonable, I think, to Mr. Bork's point. Sure. We have a good neighbor ordinance. If there are complaints received, we can take it up yeah. with, with the club. But I, I think that's compelling. I'll look to my other board. Christine. Yeah, I'm not looking for hard and fast. I was more concerned that we were approving these exact hours. But um, I do know that playing fields can be problematic for the neighborhood. Now, in this situation, I don't know how problematic, but it's a concern that I have. And as long as there's recourse, once they're there, I will feel okay about it. But traffic, you know, the loading, I'm not unloading when, I don't know how many games, how many fields, um, yep. what hours, I, it can be very problematic. Well, <clears throat> can I just ask, Brian, is, is there any municipal body that's going to consider traffic and lighting issues after we dispose of this? Yes, absolutely. Traffic and lighting are part of the site plan review process. At I'm just not sure board. about hours of operation. But traffic sure. and lighting are certainly part of that review. And, and that, that's the planning board's? That's the planning board's review. Okay. Yeah. They'll, they'll look for a lighting plan, a di uh, uh, photometric layout of the lighting, okay. the, t the fixture uh, types and the cutoff lighting, that kind of thing. They'll look for all of that stuff. Okay. Uh, and traffic studies will be a big part of their review as well. Okay. So the, the only other condition that comes to mind, in my mind, um, is I think we should require the, the residents in Kennebago Road to be informed um, as part of the uh, planning board, uh, prior to the planning board session on this. And we sh we certainly can put that in as a condition, but it will they will be anyway because the planning board when they do their notices, mm -hmm. they have a larger radius that they draw. Okay, I just want to make sure that and and, and note that um, again out of respect for kind of they've been um, vocal 
in other forms, and I want to be respectful of them. Uh, question for Brian. Uh, this is this, this parcel, the parcels in question here are in rural farming zone. This this residential area, I'm not, I'm just, I must confess, I'm just not familiar with it, mm -hmm. but is that a different zoning area? No, it's also in the RF zone. It's also RF? Yeah. So this is all farmland? It's, so that Kennebago Road, um, as I understand it, I could be wrong on this, but as I understand it, is one of those farming parcels that was broken up into family parcels back in the day. So it was a road that essentially was a big family that built houses and lived close to one another off of a parcel off of off of Two Rod Road. Mm -hmm. so, so it's just one big family that subdivided the lot. Yeah, and they're all like two and they're, they're RF lot sizes, so they're two to five acres, but it's, it's a road with mm. about 20 houses on it. Yeah, because so. it's a lot different than other <laughs> residential zones. That, no, uh, and if you look at it, it's a very odd little f finger coming off of Two Rod Road um, uh, that is unusual relative to what the other houses on Holmes Road and all the rest are. And, I, and, and that's, I think because of that anomaly, that's why they've been, un, they've been concerned about the increase in traffic on Two Rod Road and the potential increase off of Holmes Road with the, with the development. Interestingly, almost all of them are former race fans, so they never complained about the Beach oh. Ridge Speedway. Oh, but no. Never, right? Exactly. So, um, maybe yeah. they're also rugby fans. They could be rugby fans. Exactly. That there's some overlap. And anecdotally, I've never received a complaint about the speed. Yeah. Never. Yeah. So, um, but uh, they're they're great. But they clearly they didn't like the speedway um, shutting down, and they're very elevated in their concerns about how that will change in the area as a result. Mm -hmm. So. So are we doing any conditions or I, suggestions, whatever you want to call it, to the planning board? I think I'd like a condition for the Kennebago Road notification to the planning board okay. just to ensure it's done, even though I know, Brian, that that um, might be done anyway, but just to ensure it's done. Are there any, I th it feels like everything else, noise and, and uh, we have um, existing ordinances that I think we are going to rely upon. Lighting and the rest, we've that is the planning board site review committee. So I think I don't think we have any other conditions that we've established. Yeah, I, I'm comfortable proceeding without conditions. Okay. So on that basis, oh, no, no conditions. You don't want. To oh, sorry. Just with that, without the, the, that one. Well, okay. although that's a condition we're putting on the town. We're just we're right. just putting as a condition of our approval that we're putting as a condition of. The, the, the board's approval that the Kennebago neighborhood needs to be uh, included and notified as part of the site plan review process. That's right. Yeah. So it's it, a, 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 it's a condition we're it's just uh, making sure putting so on the town for belts the and suspenders. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Brian, is that something they would do anyway? Well, as I say, I'm, I I can't tell you for sure, but they do have a wider net that they cast than yeah. than we right. do. We we yeah. do no. direct to butter That's notices. Right. They do, yeah. I don't know if it's a 500 foot or 1,000 It's foot, 500. 500 yeah. foot. So that would probably hit them anyway. So um, why do we put, need to put that condition? Well, on it's it a probably. It, it's yeah, belts and suspenders. It yeah. doesn't hurt anything. Yeah. So I think let's if, put if, it in. If we if don't know for sure. If their net doesn't hit them, then, then they'll extend it to make sure they're included. Yeah, if, in, in, in one of the maps in here, if you take a look at the, 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 the map, 500 feet probably gets Kennebago Road. I wouldn't. I would, well, I, not yeah, I would need to get my my straight edge and ruler out mm -hmm. to make sure. Should that we the, vote on that? Uh, we that should, condition? yeah. Uh, can we vote on that condition to the uh, to the uh, to the appeal? I think that's appropriate. So um, we'll do that by roll, uh, Dorit, real quick. Kyle Noonan. Yes. Peter Freilinger. Aye. David Bor. No. Aye. Aye. Four one. Okay. And then with that, we have um, a motion that has been seconded um, with the additional condition that was approved for one. Um, can we, does the board have any need for additional conversation? Okay. Then why don't we have uh, a, a vote on the appeal? Uh, or, Dorit? Kyle Noonan? Yes. Peter Freilinger? Yes. David Borb? Yes. Michelle Stevenson? Yes. And Christine Snow? Aye. 
That's going to be the running joke of this yeah. board, actually. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Appreciate you um, your patience as we uh, deliberate that. Um, that is all for the um, regularly scheduled um, uh, items on tonight's agenda. Are there any other items or discussions among the board? If well, I have a question about our second alternate who hasn't shown up. Yeah, or? that's a good question. Oh, why were? Oh, well, well, how come you're not? Yeah, why weren't you up here? Well, yeah. I wasn't sure what the protocol was, so I. This is okay. First time he's no, no. We want you. We do. I wasn't, I wasn't okay. Voting. Well, let's talk about that a little bit because um, what um, we really want you to be part of discussion, okay. and even though you're not voting. Yeah, okay. Fun. It gives you the opportunity to say what you think. Oh, I, I learned a lot tonight, so it was yeah. nice watching. I good. thought you were an opposing neighbor for one of these uh, appeals. Yeah, me too. I was <laughs> so waiting for you to get up and <laughs> complain about Higgins <laughs> Beach or something. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, welcome. Months, so I for, uh, it's okay. Oh, great. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Joe. Yeah. And for the avoidance of doubt, too, we... When you're an alternate, and not a voting alternate, as Kyle was a voting alternate tonight, um, we will not include you on the votes um, because that's been a matter of confusion in the past. Okay. But we will definitely ask you to be part of the commentary, and and and, and that is partially, certainly when I was started on here, it's helpful to be just a part of that, and that gets you into the run of things on the on the board. But the other thing is, you know, you volunteered, and the town is brought you on the board for a reason, and we'd love to have your input and, and value your judgment. So, terrific. Welcome, Joe, then, then, uh, then uh, as part of the unannounced business, we'd like to welcome Joe as uh, welcome, our Joe. new second yeah. alternate. Um, I did want to say that I liked your idea about getting Parks and Rec involved. I just didn't want it to, like, keep that, hold them up. Yeah, I think that was the right thing to so do. So I didn't mean to totally dismiss yeah. that, but no, I no. thought it was a good thought. Yeah. No, Michelle, I think, and, and, and we are an official body, so I need to be careful about that sometimes in terms of recommending the discussion versus attaching a condition. And that's, that was, a, I thought, actually a really great comment. Um, and uh, thank you. This is, I appreciate the board support, especially David, and correct, course correcting me early on. Um, uh, if you think about it, this is my first real zoning board as chair. Um, and Brian, welcome back to the full fold, actually, on that uh, as well. Um, I didn't know if I was ever going to be back here. <laughs> that was, <laughs> I, 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 will, I hope that we never have to deal with an administrative appeal again because it's just such a weird thing. Um, but I thank you all for helping me through my first real set of standard variances. So thank you, you um, great, all of us. Yeah. Um, with that, we need oh, a motion to... Uh, one oh, one thing I just want to mention uh, for the board's... Um, information as well as the public's starting May 1st the town office hours will be changing no oh, yeah uh, 7 to 5 Monday through Thursday and closed on Friday Correct. Yeah, good for you guys hey, so um, yeah. that doesn't necessarily affect me but the town office hours <laughs> will be <laughs> Monday through Thursday 7 to 5 yeah. um, in the past oh, has hasn't one day of the week been later uh, they have had uh, later hours on Wednesdays, I believe. The in order to office, um, yeah. accommodate working people who maybe don't get out until five. Or right. Uh, apparently, the feedback was that um, one day a week is not enough, and and we'd rather have four days a week and then one day with just closed. So, okay. Well, they also by opening earlier, they're going to catch people maybe before they on go on the to way work. to work. Yeah. That's oh, that's right. Point. So they, they open at eight right now. Yeah. So. yeah. Okay. Okay. With that, we uh, need a motion to close to adjourn, folks. David, a motion so to adjourn. Moved. Second. I second that. Thank you, Kyle. All in favor? Yeah. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.